like we always do with this time. I go for mine, I get to shine. Now throw your hands up in the sky. Go go for mine, I get to shine. Now throw your hands up in the sky. Startups, this is episode number, Tyler? Seven. Episode seven. We've made it through six shows. This is the seventh. I am guaranteeing right now this show is going to be 10 out of 10. We've got an awesome show today. Uh, one of my good friends is here, Don Dodge from Microsoft is here. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, you've seen the program before. I've watched every show. Every show? I have. Oh, well, thanks. That's really great. Uh, <laughs> what do you think of the show so far? Uh, I love it. I like the questions. The calling questions are great. Your guests are terrific. We're doing good with the guests, and the calling questions uh, is actually people's favorite part of the show. Uh, for those of you who are calling, who are watching today, uh, to watch Sean, one of the founders of GameFly, be on the show, he's not available. Unfortunately, he got sick this morning. He sends his regrets. He's going to be on in a couple weeks. But my friend Don Dodge, who is from Microsoft, who's in BizDev, who has helped me a lot with the uh, TechCrunch 50 show, uh, is uh, now uh, happened to be in town. Right. Tyler called you. Yes, and boom, you came over, which I really appreciate the last minute uh, coming over. So tell us, what, do you, what exactly do you do at Microsoft? Well, I work in something called the Emerging Business Team. And there we work with startups, venture capitalists, and angel investors to uh, try to find great companies that are doing great things with Microsoft, show them some love and attention, uh, make introductions for them, that kind of thing. So it's a basic business development job. Yeah. And... Uh, it's got to have been like a fantastic two weeks at Microsoft with Bing <laughs> actually being a good product. It's Microsoft terrific. made a good search product. Everybody thought that you guys would not be able to do it, and you came out, and it's good. Yeah, yeah, it is what's good. The, what's, the, what's the climate like at Microsoft? Well, it's pretty upbeat, pretty optimistic. Um, you probably saw in the news that Steve Ballmer said he's going to continue to invest uh, a lot of money in yeah. search. So we're aggressive. We're going to do it. Awesome. And uh, were you shocked at how good it is? No, not really, because we had been using it internally for, for at least six months. Right. So I had seen it. Um, and the truth is, it had always been pretty darn good. Yeah. Uh, and when you compare results... Right. Uh, There's parity. There is. Yeah. yeah. So then what makes it so... Uh, consumers like it so much? Is it the UI design? Is it some of the little added features? Um, yeah, it feels different subtle. than live, um, the design, the feel, everything. Yeah, it is. It's very subtle. Uh, but the results are better. The, the look and feel is better. Some of the uh, features. Uh, I, the features I noticed were the uh, mapping and directions and uh, some yeah. of the suggested searches, yeah. alternative searches. Those things were, were pretty good. And uh, sounds like the people at Google... <laughs> not to put you on the spot, are actually a little concerned about it, which is to get their attention, considering they're the dominant player with 70%, 75% market share here in the United States. Uh, that says something, too. Well, I, that may be a little overplayed, though. I, yeah. I think it's like uh, the Intel guy said, only the paranoid survive. So right. they aren't going to sit back and watch right. anything happen. They're going to re respond. Um, well, congratulations on it. I mean, actually, I was shocked because I would say, the previous product was like two or three out of ten, and Google's like a nine or, you know, an eight or nine out of ten. And so just instantly, you guys, I feel you guys sort of caught up instantly. And now it's really up to Google now to, to sort of advance the product, which is great. Competition is awesome. And people yep. tend, how long have you been at Microsoft? Almost five years. Yeah. It's an interesting company, I think, in that people uh, discount Microsoft like in, cer in certain spaces like they said oh they'll never be able to do anything in video games that's gonna be just a disaster <laughs> right they said the same thing about databases I remember right. 15 years ago Microsoft was just an operating system on your laptop right. on your desktop right. and the thought of having Microsoft Windows be a server in the enterprise right. was laughable right not anymore right same thing with databases right. it was Oracle right. and nobody else right. not anymore right same thing with games right. uh, Nintendo and the others were yeah. dominant right and Microsoft came PlayStation from yeah, yeah and time. Xbox is just a terrific platform even the Zune which people have dogged for a long time I mean obviously it's got a great competitor in the iPod 
the Zoom 2, I saw it. It's like pretty buttery. I mean, with the yeah. HD and Bomber was running around the D conference with it. It looked kind of nice. The first Zoom was out, got out too quick, and it was yeah. too big and, and not Clunky. really good. The second Zoom, the one that's out now, is just terrific. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we promised we'd have call-ins, and so what's that noise? <laughs> Whoa, something. <laughs> Sounds like a race car. Yeah, there's a race car. Uh, so let's take the first call. You know how this works. You're going to ask yep. a question. We're going to do the best we can to answer it in an honest way. Um, That's right. I don't know the questions in advance, so this is going to be... I don't know spot. the questions in advance, actually. That's the truth. I, I don't really? know if I've ever explained that to anybody, but I purposely don't do any research on the questions in advance. I like to give you my opinion just on the spot, nothing... You know. No preparation. This yeah. is great. Okay. Okay, so, uh, whoa, look at that. We, we're actually... I can see you. Uh, so this is Tommy Russo. Hey, Jason. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well. Now you're coming in live via Skype. Via Skype from Maui. Uh, from Maui? Yes. Awesome. Uh, where in nice. Maui exactly? Um, we're right in the downtown urban hub of Wailuku Town. Ah, okay. Uh, I honeymooned in Hana. Uh, nice. Yeah, which was very nice. I did that road to Hana, uh, <laughs> right, right. which was incredibly dangerous and fun. And then uh, I, spent, I spent a couple days at the uh, Four Seasons Maui once in a while. Nice place. Very nice. I, I also shoot guns in Maui. There's a great, next to the, um, there's a shooting range next to the Four Seasons in that canyon. So I've actually gone really? uh, clay pigeon shooting. It's fantastic. If you want to go, I'll give you the guy's name. Uh, but a lot of fun. Yes. You're very lucky to live there. So now uh, you have a question. But I got a package from you this week. You did. You I did. did. So the reason I, I wanted to have you as the first caller is because this is like one of the most brilliant ways to get somebody's attention. So regardless of what your question is, you did a fabulous job of getting my attention by doing something very sincere and interesting. So I, I, should I show what you actually did and, and then we'll get your question? Sure, yeah. Let's, okay. let's go over that. So you know, my thought, my thought was after I've been watching the show for a while, you know, I've, I've got ideas that, that I want to discuss with you. Right. And, you know, my guess is that you're getting a lot of, uh, um, a lot of response from your show, a lot of response from other uh, entrepreneurs. I don't want to be bulked. I don't want to be uh, grouped in that, uh, in that group. I needed to break through that, and I needed to stop you in your tracks and get your attention. And I stewed on it for a few weeks, and, um, and this is what I came up with, and I, it sounds like it worked. Uh, Since you it, just got the package yesterday, and I'm on the show now. Yeah, it totally worked. Congratulations to you for doing it. This was a brilliant move on your part. Not at all uh, creepy in any way. Uh, very sincere, well thought out, and you got my attention. And now I know who you are. You're from Maui. I know what you do. And this is, I think, a great lesson for people about, I think Seth Godin calls it a purple cow, like doing something a little bit out of the ordinary to get people's attention. So I'm, I'm too much drama here, but so I get in the mail this box. And that's obviously the Mahalo logo. And uh, it's on a ukulele box with our tagline, we're here to help, with the graphics from Answers over here. And then, most impressive, look at the detail here. Fondue and Taurus, my dogs. <laughs> and then a bunch of quotes from the show. Every entrepreneur wants to go faster. If you're not, da da da, you're not even over your head. That's from the last show. And then there was a quote here that I looked at and I said, this is something that I don't know if I said that or not. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, you said everything. Everything I, on that box has come out of your mouth. Everything, okay. So anyway, all these incredible quotes, which is great. The hashtag over here. And then this, every CEO needs a ukulele on their desk. Uh, and it's incredibly well crafted. And then uh, a little message here from you on the back. Right. Uh, how long did it take to make this box and construct this? You know, the, the, the copy was, was what, what took the longest time. We've got a, a very talented art department here. So we were able to, um, you know, we, um, well, first off, I publish a weekly newspaper in, in Hawaii. And I'm, I, I launched a Alternative News Weekly in 1997 at the age of 23. And I've just been pushing, uh, pushing this paper in our, in our market ever since. And... Um, so I think we'll talk about some newspaper stuff, but the idea was how do I get your attention? How do I, how do I get across to you with that? And, and um, you know, it, it, it was important to get your attention and to, you know, I've been taking what you're saying to heart. I've been listening. I listened to the Purple Cow. You, 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 uh, it was almost a throwaway line of, uh, a few weeks ago as a book recommendation, and 
um, I went for it. I, I, I used Audible. I've, I've been an Audible fan uh, uh, for quite some time. I've had an account for a few years. <laughs> I think I sucked down 25 books in the past 18 months on Audible. Um, and a lot of the recommendations that have come from you. And uh, kind of taking that stuff to heart. So I wanted to break through all of the yeah. noise and uh, get your attention. And, um, Mission accomplished. Now inside of the box, you know, here's the box. I'm opening it up is a little letter from you, which is nice, and you know, I read it and everything. And then here, uh, <laughs> obviously a ukulele, with a, I guess there's a little uh, dollar bill uh, into a Hawaiian shirt, which is a nice little touch. Somebody did a little origami. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how to play the ukulele, but at some point I will uh, learn how to play this properly. Um, nice. Very nice. And, uh, so now that you've got my attention, I know a couple of things. This is why you did a good job. I know you're from Maui. I know you're an all publisher. You're doing local news. And uh, you're a fan of the show. You're obviously an entrepreneur. You're a rabid entrepreneur from what I gather. So yeah. what's the question? What are you struggling with? What do you, what, what do you want to know? Uh, what, what's behind the man who constructed a beautiful custom box and sent me a ukulele? I got to know. Well, the idea here is that there's a new frontier for, for the media business. Right now, media business is, is, is falling apart. We know newspapers are failing. We know the daily model no longer works. Um, you know, the TV model and the radio model hasn't got the attention yet, but it soon will. Uh, Internet is changing everything. And what I see from my industry of, as a publisher in the Alt Weekly uh, business is that Alt Weeklies were the innovative product to daily newspapers 40 years ago. Papers like the v Village Voice and... Uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Guardian. Um, these papers were progressive. They were alternative. They were the shiny new toy. They were the purple cow of their day. And what's happened, it, again, is, is that these papers haven't innovated. Um, they haven't changed. They haven't, um, you know, this, the Internet has been out for a while now, and, and, and newspaper publishers have, have had this concern of how do we get our papers online. That's not the right question. The question is how do we dominate our market with news media through this new tool? And, and it may not be, um, I don't see the weekly model changing uh, as fast, uh, as rapidly as the daily newspapers um, are, 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 the changes are happening there. Um, the overhead is, uh, is significantly less. We're only printing one day a week. Um, our staffs are not, uh, you know, a lot of daily newspapers in urban areas are going you know, have 10 times the staff that a, a weekly will have. And through modern technology, I think that we can, we can revolutionize the, the, it's not just a weekly newspaper anymore. These are, these are going to be regional media companies that uh, produce content further than they've, uh, in, in a larger geographic area than they once did. And we need, uh, the, the, the advantage that a weekly paper has is that we are on the streets. We, you know, these, all these alt weeklies uh, across the nation, we have our relationships with the clubs, with the venues, with the restaurants, with right. the small business uh, uh, folks. And that is what, um, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, online search companies are trying to get into the trenches with us. We're already there, and right. we don't realize it. So my ideas are to, are to, to come up with a way to uh, help these small businesses to, to build the community from the ground up and expand it much wider. Um, you know, right now we're complaining, the newspapers are complaining about content is being stolen and, and picking, picked up on blogs and, and Google's aggregating all this news across the country and, 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 the, and the revenue and the news sources aren't being credited properly and, if, and the financing isn't going with that either. So, so if, we're losing our, if, if we're losing our content, if we're sharing our content, then why aren't we really sharing our content? Why aren't we building APIs to really get our content out yeah. there? Why aren't so, we building mobile applications to interact with our clients on a street level? Um, so how is your business doing? I, I mean, I get the idea that you're trying to revolutionize this and change it. So uh, how is your business doing? And, and is there a, a specific question for me? I do have a specific question. Yeah. Um, first, we're doing fine. Um, from, a, uh, from a weekly perspective, we're, we're doing fine. We're, we're one of the hottest products on the island. Our daily is owned by, by a, a, a company out of uh, West Virginia. And it's, you know, it's a very long reach. And, and dailies are struggling. It's, as hard right. as they're going to work to save, to save what they're doing, it's going to be a difficult task for any daily to, to, to make it right. you know, several years from now, let alone 10 years from now. Um, my, my question is this. If we're, um, as I expand my media company, I'm looking for, I'm looking for investors. I'm looking yeah. for help. I'm looking for um, you know, a lot of what you're reading is, uh, uh, is that these papers don't have the resources to compete yeah. at the level that they need to. So right. um, I think I have an advantage because I know 
how we need to compete. I know where we need to compete. I, I have an idea of how to get so, there. But at this point, I don't have the financing to get there. Right. So, so my question is this. How, um, I have an established company. I need to bring investors in. At what point do I have to... Um, am I going to be obligated to sell my company to satisfy uh, investors' um, needs as far as their return on the money they've invested with me? Um, or is this something where I can work out a package where I can bring investors in and maybe the paths aren't as large because, uh, you know, in this new model there is profit, but it's, it's a much thinner profit than we've had in the past. Yeah. Uh, so the question about financing, where do you get the financing from, what type of financing should you get is a great question. Um, the main issue is media companies are not a venture capital type of investment. They very rarely have worked out from, for uh, venture capitalists. And you sort of hinted at why. It, the return on investment is just not as great. Media companies right. have a more modest return than a software company, than a Google, than a service, than a search engine, than many, uh, you know, et cetera. But I did a blog network, so it was yeah. part technology, part platform. So if you were going to try to get venture capitalists, you would have to go for more of a platform type company to help lo build local news sites. And they might be interested. But they've already invested in a lot of things like back fence and it's, it hasn't worked out. Uh, local is the hardest nut to crack. And I think that the, the local space and that local news space is going to be filled by not um, big money investors, but by rather local groups of passionate people who want to have it as a lifestyle business who want to have it as, it's a job, I'm passionate about it, but the same way people open a local restaurant because they're following their muse, they're passionate about it, not to make a great return. And right. when that happens, I think the magic will come back to the local news. Uh, and the investors in it are going to be local people who are affluent, who do it because they love where they live. But it's a hard business, the local business now, for people to really make a lot of money from. Uh, so I, don't, I think you can have a hard time getting the sort of big picture investors because uh, they've been burned in the space and very few people have made it work. Maybe Yelp would be an exact, uh, uh, um, one that has worked or City Search did work, but those aren't really news products as such. So I, I think it's going to be very hard to convince investors who are venture investors. I think you will get the local investors who have a look at it more for vanity or for... Uh, uh, they, they, they're affiliated with it in some way. They have an affinity for it uh, because they're is, passionate is there, about it. Is it possible there's a misunderstanding on the type of new media company? Um, you know, we're talking, when, when you say that there's difficulty in getting people to invest into media companies, are you still referring to old media companies or a new media company? Because I think, new media changes at all. Um, yeah. Even the I mean, it's an entirely different model at that point. We're, we're, yeah. I mean, it's not a, a paper product. It's not just a website. It's an entire package that I feel that uh, news agencies or media companies will need to have to create much, much further than they, they've ever gone. Um, and at that point, it, it doesn't really feel like the same old models of a media company. So I don't really, you know, in my perspective, those metrics may not uh, have the same effect as they have, have had in the past. You know, you might be the guy who figures it out. Uh, nobody really has. I mean, you, there's been a long series of people. Dan Gilmore tried to do one. A lot of people have tried to do local stuff. Curbed is doing local for real estate. Right. Uh, there was Met, Met Blogs, and there was LAist, and uh, these other ones. A lot of people have tried it, uh, and they haven't really built it into big businesses, little boutique businesses. Some of them have garnered a little bit of venture investment. It's possible to get it. Uh, it's possible you're right about where it's going. I, th I think you, your nose is going in the right direction. There is something there. So right. it's going to take... I think you're going to have a better route getting angel investors. I don't think you're going to convince the venture investors because I don't think they're going to understand it yet. They're going to want to see sure. some more proof points. And they're looking at the newspaper business going, yeah, that's being destroyed because people don't want to read it. And they're going to be need, need to be convinced that people really have a need for it. But let's ask Don, since he's here, are you guys invested in any local uh, businesses or are there any you're familiar with? And what advice do you have for our caller? Uh, First of all, no, Microsoft is not invested yeah. in those sorts of things. I, don't, I agree with you. I don't think venture capital investors will do it either. Right. It's more of an angel thing. Even if you look at the big newspapers, the Boston Globe, the New York Times, those were family-run yeah. newspapers that grew into big businesses. They didn't get venture capital investment. Right. Uh, so I, angel investors, yeah, they, they might do something like this. The problem with hyperlocal is where it's at. That's, right. There's a great opportunity right. there. But the problem is scale. 
Right. Investors look for scale. So hyperlocal, by definition, means small. Right. Small. And investors want scale. Right. So uh, I don't think you're going to see big investors get into this kind of thing. Right. Uh, and the online only... online's a different matter. Yes. Yeah, if you're doing hyperlocal online and you can scale it across the country or across the world, that's a different matter. Yeah. Which nobody's been able to do yet, no. which means there's an opportunity. And since it's hard, that means there's a really big opportunity. So right. if you right. do crack the nut, you would have, I think, uh, uh, have done something significant. Uh, but it's a, you had a great question. I uh, appreciate the attention. And we'll talk offline. Uh, and uh, I really thank you for calling. And as a thank you, uh, I'd love to invite you to be my guest at TechCrunch 50, September thank 14th and 15th, if you can catch a flight from Maui to San Francisco. Sure. You think you can make and it? You've got, and you're hosting a, a local search summit in San Francisco as well. I am. Month? Uh, okay. you, will, you will be my guest at that event as well, if you want to come. Love to. Yeah, love so to. we're doing the local search summit, which somebody could put the information on the bottom of the screen here. What's the exact URL of that, Tyler? Localsearchsummit.com. Localsearchsummit.com. There you go, localsearchsummit.com. And the date is July 17th. 17th. So we're doing a one-day event about local search, something I'm trying to learn about. And, uh, yeah, it'd be great if you come. We can meet in person. We'll get a cup of coffee. And, great, uh, Tommy, uh, I really appreciate it. And... Uh, Mahalo for calling in. Yeah, I expect uh, a little somewhere over the rainbow when I meet with you. Absolutely, <laughs> I will. Uh, get who's the guy who sings that? The the big guy who passed away is so beautiful. Biz. Biz. Brother is. Come brother is. Okay. Uh, can we end the show with that? By the way, can we get Brother Is's version <laughs> of this in the YouTube, and we'll play it for you. Um, yeah, it'd be great. Tommy, really great call, uh, and really great purple cow. And yeah. by the way, did you do your homework? I you, did, but you know what? I fell asleep the last half hour. Don't worry about it. But you've got to catch up on your homework. We'll talk about it when I see you. And uh, yeah. when we have coffee, I'm going to drill you on your homework. Okay. All right, Tommy. Take care, right. and thanks Appreciate for calling yep. in. Aloha. All right. That went pretty well. That was great. Uh, pretty good question. And that only took uh, half an hour for one call. And we're doing <laughs> six. So it's going to be uh, only a three-and-a-half-hour show with the news. Uh, let's go to our next call. Scott Simcoe, he's wondering uh, how to price subscriptions for his new site. And let's get Scott on the line. Uh, that will take a moment, and i got to get the ukulele stuff away over here. Ukulele is awesome. Get a little sip of the water. Very nice. And uh, I'm just going to give a little shout-out to the people uh, who are, while they're getting the call set up, using the pound twist. Oh, I'm supposed to uh, pick it up over here. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, uh, Scott, just hold on one second while I thank the sponsors. Okay, Scott? Okay, Jason. Okay. Scott, do you know who the sponsors are? Uh, yeah, they're uh, DNA Mail, uh, Ustream, and WebSpy. I love it. I love it. So, <laughs> Scott, uh, tell me, uh, what does uh, DNA Mail do? DNA Mail, well, <laughs> I don't okay. use the, the service, so um, what, uh, well. I'll tell you right now. Don't worry. Okay. It, okay. This, is, this is what advertising is about. We got the impression and now, after multiple shows, we're going we're gonna to get you guys to understand who these companies are. And uh, I have to say, this is masterful. We're doing a really good job for the advertisers because people actually know who the advertisers are on the show. Uh, so just really quick, WebSpy, uh, who's been amazing. Like, look at this website they built. They actually built a landing page at webspy.com slash twist. And uh, they do software that lets you audit what your people are doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if your people are screwing around at work, instead of you being like the draconian boss, uh, like I am sometimes, uh, I'm getting better. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, I hate having to like, I, you know, as a boss, you never want to be like the guy who's like, what are you doing on Facebook? Are you screwing around reading blogs? You want people, it's like a blend of they're working and they're, you know, they work long hours. So if they have to do some personal stuff, you want to sort of be cool about it. But anyway, they give you a summary of what you, your each employee, like the websites they spent and all that. But that's not for you. It's actually for the employee to look at and monitor their own time. So okay. they have time management skills. So you don't have to be a jerk. You can just be like, hey, boom, you, you monitor yourself. And people want to do the right thing. So if they see they're spending 90 minutes on Facebook, and mm -hmm. it's transparent, they're like, you know what? I don't need to spend 90 minutes on Facebook every day. I'm going to limit my Facebook to 15 minutes, get in and out, and I'll do that on the weekends. Uh, so it's a great tool for people. Uh, and we really appreciate WebSpy for doing this. And they're going to give a discount of 10%. And you can see on the screen there that they've actually got Taurus. Uh, they talked to Taurus's agent, and uh, he agreed. He got, Taurus got a licensing fee for this. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so Taurus is uh, Taurus approved for the web spy. Uh, 
And then uh, DNA mail, DNA mail, everybody loves DNA mail. DNA mail uh, is exchange hosting, Google app, Google app hosting. If you're a startup company, you, you don't want to be, and you're under 100 people, Don, tell me, should I be setting up my own servers, and should I just outsource this? Absolutely. No, definitely. I mean, you're from Microsoft. These guys are one of your partners. Yep. Uh, you, have you heard of DNA mail before? Yes, I have. Oh, so, Don, uh, you love DNA mail. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Don loves DNA mail. He's from Microsoft. He endorses it. What more do you need to know? DNA mail, great sponsor. And, of course, Ustream is awesome for sponsoring the show and doing the streaming and let people go crazy in the chat room as well. Um, if Jason says DNA mail three times in a row, chug a beer. DNA mail, <laughs> DNA mail, DNA mail. Is this the drinking game? We've already got a drinking game. And now everybody knows, as part of the tradition, what you're supposed to do right now, if you're at home, you're watching the show, and you appreciate the show and everything the show provides and all the hard work Tyler and Alex and everybody put into it. I don't put much hard work into it. Frankly, I just show up uh, and take credit for all the hard work they do. Then a great thing to do is go on Twitter and just say, I want to thank at DNA mail, at WebSpy, and at Ustream, pretty easy to spell those, for supporting Pound Twist. And then all your friends are going to be like, what the hell is that? And you explain to them what Twist is, and then they go check out the sponsors, and the sponsors feel good about it. Also want to point out, DNA mail and WebSpy had such a good experience after just six shows, they signed on for another 10. <laughs> they signed on for 20 shows. I mean, this is incredible support. I, I, I'm just blown away. I very much appreciate it because I love doing the show, and it's not cheap. We gotta, you know, but we're going to use that money to buy even better cameras and do even more production. So it's, it's, it's a great thing for them. It's a great thing for the audience. It's a win-win-win for everybody. And I'd like to point out, since they've done those 20 shows, I invited them to actually come on the show because I thought that would be cool. They come on, we'll talk about their businesses for five or ten minutes and talk about entrepreneurship. Maybe they could sit in for a question or two. I think that would be a cool thing to do since they did it for 20 shows. They're all and, startups too. So. And they're startups too, so I'll get those guys in here, whatever. Uh, we're just blending the whole thing. The advertising and the social media, we're, we're experimenting and making it crazy. Uh, okay, so look at all these people now are thanking them. On, I mean, that's pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, pull up, now on the Twitter, you can see over there, Don. They're all thanking the sponsors. I mean, it's insane. Uh, so the show is cooking. The show is doing really well. Production value keeps going up. And we're lucky to have Scott uh, Simcoe here. Uh, Scott, where are you based? What's the uh, name of your company? And what's your question? Okay, I'm in uh, Cross Junction, Virginia. My company uh, is in the initial stages of uh, development. It's going to be called The Flyby. Uh, and what my question, I have three questions, but the one that revolves around my company is, because I'm going to be a, a small startup, and it's going to be, I, I plan on the, the marathon versus the sprint to sure. uh, getting started. And I, I'm, with regard to advertising space and, and getting a starting price point, when you're a very new company, you don't have a lot of traffic. Yep. You know, it makes, you know, it's pretty obvious that you're not going to be able to command what some of the other uh, uh, websites do in your niche um, command for advertising space. What is a good point to start at so that my, when I do have to change the price, say, in a year, it's not either too drastic or sure. I price myself too low where somebody signs on for a year and now I have, you know, this ad space locked in at such a yeah. low price. Here's the, here's the <clears throat> idea. What you want to do is you want to have the advertisers who support you early on get an absurdly good deal and make them feel really good about it. Okay. And then you want to, when they re-up, you can tell them, like, listen, hey, we're increasing the price. The show has obviously grown. You've gotten a great deal in the past. We want to keep you on. We're going to give you a 25% founder's discount for staying on board uh -huh, okay. with your sponsorship. But if you don't want to do it, we understand. We really want to have you here. But, you know, we obviously, the business isn't growing, and the costs are, in, you know, increasing. And so what I always like to do when building media properties is go and meet with the person. Explain to them your vision. And sales is, uh, somebody told me this once, I don't remember who, but it's transference of enthusiasm. If you're excited about what you're doing, they're going to be excited about it. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about This Week in Startups, DNA Mail, Ustream, uh, and uh, WebSpy are all excited about it. I just told them, hey, listen, sponsor the show, it's $1,000 a show. You know where I came up with that number? Mm. I just pulled it out of the air. Okay. I told them, I said, I don't know how many people are going to watch. I don't know if this is, what value you're going to get out of it. You tell me, sign up for 10 shows, we'll see what happens. And then they wanted to sign up for the next 10 shows. So I, I gave them the same price. Who cares? Six months from now, I can always raise the price. Uh, and if they grow with the show, that's great. You want to keep them on board, and you want to make them feel special. And you should make them feel special because they're supporting you early on. And 
sales is transference of enthusiasm in the beginning, and then it's relationship after that. Re really good sales, I believe, and it's partnership based. So if they feel like you're checking in with them, you're going to lunch with them, and that they're growing with you, just build that relationship. So when, when the next guy comes on who's a competitor and says, oh, well, I, I want to take away you know, the flyby's business, and, uh, you know, and they go, well, you know what? I, Scott's a good guy. I believe in his vision. Why would I do that? And actually, Don uh, can recount this episode. Don got involved with uh, the TechCrunch 40 conference. The first one. The first one because how, how did that happen? Uh, you sent me a note. I sent you a note, yeah. Yeah, and said, hey, would you like to get involved? Yeah. And yeah, I wanted to get involved, and Microsoft wanted to get involved, right. so we did. And Microsoft wasn't a sponsor the first year. Right. I just emailed Don because I liked his blog, and so I was a fan of his blog. I invited him to come be a judge. Uh, nobody knew who Don was, no offense. You, it wasn't <laughs> like you were a bomber or something like that. You weren't like the highest profile guy at the company, but you were, I thought, right. one of the most considered persons from your blog post. If I'm reading it, it's probably pretty good. I'm a fellow blogger. And then the next year, Microsoft immediately sponsored. They sponsored again this year, and they've been a tremendous, tremendous uh, partner in the event. And now Don's on the show. So it, it really is about relationships. You like working with people. People are human beings. People forget. You know, they say, oh, it's not personal, it's business. I say right. BS. All business is very personal. I take it extremely personal. I take it too personal in most cases. You know, I, I, get, I get a little crazy about how personal it is for me. Like, Competing with Jimmy Fails, Wales, uh, other people I've competed with, Nick Denton, who actually we're friends now, but I get crazy about it, you know, in terms of competition and how personal it is for me. And that's what it should be. It should be personal, right? This is your passion. And right. so you got to go in there, meet the advertiser, sell them on your vision, sell them on your passion, get their feedback, listen to what their needs are, and then try to solve their problems. And if it's not a fit, move on. If it's okay. not going to work for them, move on. Because you're wasting time. If, they, if they're not ready for it, like I didn't ask Microsoft to sponsor the first year. I, I, right. I invited Don. I, I don't know how to navigate Microsoft. I don't have the time. You know, the, co the conference was coming up. But he came and he said, you know what? Mike, Arrington, Heather, and Jason, they put on a pretty good show. Great show. And I enjoyed it. The audience enjoyed it. It did something good for startup communities. Microsoft's involved with the startup community. We should be involved. So if you build a good product and you're, I think, a decent human being, I think people will want to work with you. I mean, what do you think, Don? It's a, it's a good absolutely, question. Absolutely, absolutely. You're right. It is all personal yeah. and all about enthusiasm, and, and you're a perfect example of, of that. Yeah. You can see the enthusiasm, yeah. and you want to invest in people like that. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned advertising. I think you really meant sponsorship, right? So that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yes. Early on, it's always sponsorship. Sponsorship mm -hmm. is a translation for we don't have a lot of traffic yet. Take a okay. flyer. That's what sponsorship means. I mean, I hate right. to be blunt about it because I'm offering sponsorships for Twist, but sponsorship generally means this might be a little overpriced. We don't know what's going to happen, but take a flyer and support us. Right. Okay. And it's maybe not going to work on a metrics basis, and you can be honest about that. It's mm -hmm. a big company. They'll make a decision. You know, At some point, Audible sponsored This Week in Tech when it was very small. GoDaddy did the same. And I think Leo was like, I don't know how big this could be. We'll figure it out, and you'll be there with us on the journey. And you know what? A big company, they like to do that. They'll, they'll take a flyer. Uh, and if it grows, then they get paid back in the future. So we did the same thing with Joystick. Um, DLP Projectors sponsored Joystick for like $25,000 a month for the first six months, which for a blog deal was like, what? Huge. You, people couldn't believe we had $150,000 sponsorship. Well, for the first three months, they, we got the better of that deal. For the last three months, the tra site was getting so much traffic that they were getting like a dollar CPM. Uh, and then they re-upped. So you got to be loyal to your people like this. And, and really transfer that enthusiasm and meet with them. Just okay. beg them, can I get a cup of coffee with you? I, I'm okay. in the area. That's one of my tricks. I, I did this many times. Mm -hmm. I tell somebody, I'm going to be in your area. Can I stop by for a cup of coffee and just show you what I'm doing? Especially when I was younger in my career and I couldn't get meetings. And they'd be like, well, if you're in the area, fine, get a cup of coffee. You know what? <laughs> it, I wasn't in the area. Whoops. Right, you know that? Right. So, 154, <laughs> Jason Curses, for, for the first time in the show. Um, I wasn't in the area. I did this one time with somebody. I'm not going to say who. I told them, I'm going to be in D.C. next Wednesday. Can we stop and get a cup of coffee? You know what? I wasn't going to D.C. that week. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing in D.C.? I was like, I'm, I'm meeting with a couple of clients. Wasn't true. Right. But the guy's like, yeah, you're in D.C. anyway. You're from New York. Okay, I'll meet with you. This is the way to do it. Make okay. it easy for them. Transferring enthusiasm, it's all going to work out. 
Oh, is it, that sounds well, like great advice. If if you don't mind on the yeah. TechCrunch, um, uh, we you were mentioning that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like some of the the companies that come to you guys to showcase their product yeah. aren't fully developed. What is the minimum you've seen as somebody that has been asked to show their product at the yeah. at the conference? And what is I guess the the most prepared you've seen? Um, you know, is is there uh, an expected level? Uh, you know, I'm thinking for a future idea. Yeah, you know, that, it's a great uh, question. It's a great question. Um, you know. I think when they when the deadline comes up at the end of this month, we like to see a couple slides, maybe a working prototype. You submit a little video explaining your idea. It can be a little rough. We okay. want the companies to launch at the event from the stage. Some do, some don't make it. We're okay. a little bit flexible about that. So somewhere between the June 30th deadline and the September 14th day you get on stage, we want that product. We can actually see it and say this is a real product. It's not vaporware. Okay. So in the example of Yammer, they had a fully baked product. They were using it internally, and they had three beta clients. In the case of PowerSet, in the first year, they were like, we're going to show you something. And like, it was 10 days before the event. And I'm like, I haven't seen anything. We accepted you based on some of this stuff, but we really need to see it. As the years have gone on, it's, you know, last year, uh, Dom was there for both the years. I mean, the difference in preparedness and the products that were launched. Huge. What would you say? I mean, oh, it was an order of magnitude better. Yeah, it's, I mean, people now better. are preparing for this event. So, in order to be truly competitive and get in, you really have to get the product pretty close to launch. I think in the summer, July, let's say, and definitely be ready to launch then. Professional design, very important, mm -hmm. look and feel. Right. Very professional, um, you know, pitch, which we could we could do a whole show on just pitching, and we will do that. We should somebody make a note. We should do a show on pitching and just you know have people come in and actually pitch, and then walk them through how to do it. Um, but uh, if you have any more questions about that, you know how to email me, Jason at Mahalo, and actually uh, Alex at Calacanis, Alex Miller, who works uh, with me for the Calacanis Conference Company, uh, Alex at Calacanis.com, and just, we'll, we'll walk you through it in detail. But uh, okay. great questions, and uh, since you were so great to come on the show, you're going to be at TechCrunch 50 as my guest. Oh, if you can thank make you it. very much. So, uh, well, I definitely can. I used to work for the airline, so I have benefits still. So There you go. So uh, you just saved $1,500 on a ticket, and you probably should just tweet that. Jason's like the most amazing guy in the world. Whatever you want to say. <laughs> I don't want to skew your tweet, but you know, I'm trying to do some uh, damage control of my reputation here. So say something incredibly nice about me. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Great call, honestly. Time. Good call. And I'll see you at TechCrunch. Make sure you say hello. I will. Thank okay, you. Okay, cheers now. Bye. All right. Two good calls. We're, making, we're going faster now, so people can feel the pace is picking up. Guys, tell me what you think of the calls and how much time we're spending on them. Uh, online fest. Da, 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 da. I'm just looking at the tweets here. If you want to pull up my screen, we can take a look at a couple of the tweets. Uh, da, 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 da. That's a lot of thank yous to the sponsors. Nice job to Tommy Russo. Uh, and uh, Oh, look at this. Tommy Russo is actually getting... Some a fellow person on the show is emailing Tommy Russo saying, hey, let's get together and talk about your ideas. Now that's what's really good about the show is building community. Great brands have a great community around them. Okay, caller number three, Michael Rubin. Is we're going to get him on the uh, Skype or is he coming on the line? Uh, phone line? Phone line it is. Okay, and Michael Rubin is coming from the 217. Let's see, I don't even know what the 217 is. Probably an area code. No, I know it's an area code, but from the, I don't know what the 217 actually is. Okay, so Michael Rubin of the 217, uh, you've yeah. got a pretty difficult question. Um, thanks for taking my question. So I'm working on a small project that started out as a 50-50 joint venture between my company and a good friend of mine, and it's a side project for both of us. We both have full-time jobs. And uh, the product we're developing is my friend's idea. I've done all the programming, and he was supposed to do everything else. And at first, we both worked really hard, and we had a really good working relationship. But over time, he's dropped off yep. more and more until I think he's lost interest in the project, even though he won't admit it. Hmm. And um, as a tech guy, I've never been in this situation, and yep. I don't know what to do with him. Can I kick him out if it's his idea? And before it gets to that point, what do I need to try with him? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's a great question. This happens frequently. Um, and we can, we can get you through this. This is not an impossible task. This happens all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, YouTube had a founder who left early. Everybody yep. knows Chad Hurley. Uh, everybody uh, knows the other guy, uh, Stephen, Stephen Chen. But there was a third founder. Yep. Happens all the time. Uh, people 
can lose interest. That's okay. People are allowed to lose interest. Move on to other things. Um, and it's one of the great things about being an entrepreneur. You can follow your muse. Um, so, question one. Do you guys have any kind of a written agreement, or is it just a gentleman's agreement? We have a joint venture agreement, but it basically says we split profits 50-50, we split costs 50-50, that's all. Right. Okay. Uh, and so if you have this joint venture, the intellectual property of the joint venture, and you can get a lawyer to do this, it's probably you co-own it. He didn't pay you for it, but since you said you were doing a joint venture and you, you did this joint venture agreement with a lawyer or you just wrote a letter? Uh, we used the template and did it ourselves. Okay. So... For all intents and purposes, you're equal partners on this. You may be putting in different amounts of time, but you did a project together. When people do a venture-backed company together, they have to vest their interest in the company. Uh, are you familiar with the concept of vesting your interest, in investing your stock? Yes. Okay, so you guys didn't do that in this kind of arrangement. You just took founder shares. So it puts you in a little bit of a bind because, you know what? He owns half the company day one, you own half the company day one. In an ideal world, you would say, we're going to vest our shares over four years. And so if one person leaves the project after two, the other person then owns 75% of the shares, and the person owns 25 Much more equitable. You guys didn't do that. That's OK. I'm assuming you didn't have that clause in there, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. So that's OK. Not the end of the world. What you need to do is, you need, how long have you guys been working on it? Uh, about nine months. OK. So. You need to sit down with your partner and say, listen, I get the sense you're not as into the project. I understand that. It's no problem. I am interested in the project. I'd like to do it. However, obviously, if I'm going to work on this for the next five years and you're not, I don't feel it's equitable, and you probably agree with me. It's a little semantic thing there. You probably agree with me that you don't deserve half of it. But you did start it, so you should get something. And so I'm willing to give you 20% in this entity, even though you're not going to work on it anymore, or 10%. If you want to keep working on it, I'm willing to keep it 50-50, but I, I don't want to force you, and you're, you're clearly not into it, and I'm putting in my, most of the effort here. So this is what I think is fair. If you have a counter to it, I'm willing to discuss that. However, I need to have this resolved in order to keep working on the project, or else I, too, am going to move on to another project. And so it's, this is my proposal. If you have a different proposal, let me know. I've very much enjoyed working with you. We're friends. Uh, it's been a great time. But you know, it is business, and we should be very clear about this now, so that if this does become something, you know, it's it's equitable. And uh, do you think you're capable of having that kind of a blunt discussion with him? I think so. But um, for the future, what could I? What signs could I have seen that would have? Um, caused me to do this a long time ago and not have wasted months of frustration. What, what signs do you look for? Well, you know, you, you can never know. You know, people get married, they date people, and then they break up with them and they get out of the fog and they go, oh my God, I can't believe I was in a relationship with such a jerk. Did you ever do that? <laughs> or, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, when you're in the midst of it, everything seems like roses, and then you get, you know, you clear your mind, and then you meet another person. You're like, oh wow, this is what is great. It's, don't don't be too hard on yourself about it. It happens. I suggest you you're gonna have to let go of the concept that this is all gonna work out. It may or may not work out. He could be a jerk about it. He could not budge. And then your counter to that is, okay, well the whole thing's going down in flames. It's over. Boom. Or since I own half the asset, I'm gonna, I think we should sell the asset on eBay or to the highest bidder. Another way people do this is they put a piece of paper and they say, I'm going to put a, piece of paper, a number on a piece of paper. And then the other party agrees to either take that number or pay that number. So you say, I think this is all worth $25,000, the work I put into it. I'm going to put $25,000 on a piece of paper. Then you give him the piece of paper. He either got to, if he agrees to this, pay the twenty-five dollars or um, take the twenty-five. dollars There's all different ways for breaking this stuff up that mediators do, which you could get one, but it's not necessary. You can just move on to another project. Uh, so uh, you can't tell. That's why people put in the provision of vesting your stock over time. They came up with that because people can't tell. And founder shares is a very powerful thing, you know. And to vest all your founder shares, very dangerous. That's why VCs, they want people to vest. I have to vest in my own company. You know, I mean, just the way it is. They, they, they don't want to invest, and then you leave the next day, and they're left holding the bag. You own half the company or a third of the company or two-thirds of the company. So uh, venture capitalists have already solved this problem decades ago. 
you know, you're, you're going to learn the hard way, but you know what? That's what being an entrepreneur is. That pain and frustration of this project will go into your next project and it will make you a stronger and better entrepreneur. And you just got to use it. And if you get, you may, I think you could save this one. And if you want, I'll talk to the guy on the phone with you. If you need a, you try it first. But if you want, I'll try to talk the guy down and tell him, hey, you know, here's the situation. Michael's going to probably move on to another project. It's going to be worth nothing. You better, better to take 10% of something than 100% of nothing or 50% of nothing. So, but you'll be, I think you'll do it. You're going to be fine. Um, and don't beat yourself up about it. It's none of, all of your failures are going to, culminate into some success at some point. So you just you got to use it. You know, it's like you, you watch the NBA at all? Yep. You saw uh, Kobe Bryant win? Huh. Yeah. What did he do last year? He got his ass kicked. He lost to the Boston Celtics. He lost to the Boston Celtics, as Tom <laughs> will tell you. He's a Boston fan. He got, not only did he lose in that last game, they whoop him by 50 points or something, or 40 40. Points? 40 point loss. Kobe Bryant in the offseason, he was PO'd. And he came back and he brought it. That's what you can do. Yeah, so this deal didn't work out. You know what? Come back to another project. It's not your only idea. You're going to have 10 million ideas. You come back twice as hard. You use the pain and suffering to put it into your next project. Because what are you going to do? Sit up there and curl up in a ball and give up? I mean, that's not an option. What do you think, Don? Well, I agree, with got some advice. I agree with everything you said. It does happen all the time. You don't read about it because it happens so often and it doesn't come to any consequence. So I try all the things that Jason suggested. And here's another twist for you. Uh -huh. Turn the tables. Tell him, I'm not interested in the project anymore. I want out. I want to sell it to you. How much do you want for it? And whatever that number is, turn around. He might say $10,000. Then turn around and say, all right, I've got $15,000. I'll pay you 50% more than you think it's worth. I'll take it for $15,000. So you've got to first have the conversation with them and, and try to do it amicably and reasonably. And if that doesn't work, then just say, all right, I'm out. I, I don't have time for this, uh, and the project's going to die. So do you want to buy it? You right. want to buy my share? Right. And this is a perfect advice. One of the critical things during this is you can't lose your cool. You have to be calm. I can tell in your voice you're a little frustrated. Are you a little frustrated, Mike? Uh, yeah, I, my gut feeling is to be really tough on the guy, but he's also my good friend, so I've right. been really passive aggressive, and I feel bad about that. Yeah, so listen, honestly, you, if you, or you, you seem like you're a pretty self aware guy. You're passive aggressive because you feel like you're getting taken advantage of and you're disappointed. So put that aside and just think business for a second. What is your goal? Your goal is you want to work this out and take this project to the next level. So forget about the emotion of it. Just focus on that goal. The goal is to, to, to work this out. Emotion, you being emotional in this situation, doesn't help. It's only like putting fire on stuff. Stay focused and have a clean, like non-emotional negotiation with him. And silence in a negotiation is your friend. Watch this. I don't think I can continue on the project unless uh, we renegotiate the percentage we own because I know that you're not going to work on it anymore. I'm willing to give you 10%. Uh, is that something that you would be comfortable with? We just sat there for eight seconds, quietly. Eight seconds is so uncomfortable for people. That's only eight seconds. You have to learn to just use that. Just tell him what you want and then let him respond to it. It's a very zen kind of thing, but in a negotiation, that helps. You just put your case out there, and you hope for the best. Mike, let me ask you a question. Yeah. What do you think would happen to this project if you stopped working on it? Um, I, I think it, it would die. Okay, there's your answer. Yeah, I mean, you have a pretty good negotiating position. I mean, it's, 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 if you're not involved, it dies. He's not involved, it's still going, which means you could go start another thing, you know? And uh, it's not like you, didn't, you signed a no-compete. Uh, in the agreement, was there a non-compete clause where you said, I agree? No, there wasn't. Yeah, so there's no non-compete. So you could just tell them straight up, listen, I'm going to stop working on this. I'm not going to use that code. I'm starting again. I've got a slightly different model. But I'm going to attack the space again and do it again. I have no non-compete clause. So essentially, this is your only shot. You either get 10% of the thing going forward, and you have non-voting shares, and I'm going for it, or I'm just starting over. And right. this whole thing is going away. And you know what? <laughs> 
You, you may get into a lawsuit based on that if you wanted to, because anybody can sue you for any time, but he's not going to. It doesn't make any sense, uh, especially if you're very clear about it and, and, the, and, the, and the arrangement is clear that there's no non-compete. And he doesn't have to live up to the non-compete either. He can go leave and go start a competitive thing, and you can tell him that. You can feel free to go leave and do a competitive thing if you want. If it gets to that second phase of negotiation, try the non-emotional, quick, clean, we, we need to ne negotiate this, we're friends. And he's a friend, so he should be happy to get 10% and have you know, a 10% upside to your future success. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. He should be thrilled that he doesn't have to work and gets 10%. And if he doesn't, he's probably a little naive and probably somebody that you're not going to be able to reason with. So then just walk away and do the next thing. And that's a big uh, part about being an entrepreneur is knowing when to walk away. So you'll be uh, fine. That's all great advice. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. No problem. Take care. I think that was pretty good. I mean, I, it's a tough situation. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And you know what? As you get older, you get less emotional about it. Mm -hmm. You can just sort of see it's like either it's going to, you're going to negotiate your way out of it or it's going to be a fight. And if it's going to be this huge big fight, better off just walking away and starting over. It's easy for us to say, but right. the thing about entrepreneurs is uh, when you're in the entrepreneurs nick nick. never give up. Yeah. They never give up. Right. They're passionate. Yeah. So any little thing like this, you're going to try to fight and try to yeah. work it out and try to make it happen. And sometimes it's not worth it. You have to just walk away. Right. And you don't want to, you know, there's an opportunity cost in all this. If you are working so hard for so long on this, I mean, you kill yourself, you could be going on to the next thing. You could waste your time for a year or two fighting court and whatever, and, and then the next opportunity, you, you miss it because you're, you're so busy fighting, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's very hard to know when to fight, when not to. It's, it's very, be very careful. It's very nuanced. But the good news is Michael is learning. All the people are at some, you know, not learning uh, and being an entrepreneur. So let's take... You mentioned yeah. leaving and going on to the next opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. That right there is one of the reasons that startups split very right. often is because one of the founders gets right. interested in something else yeah. and wants to go do something else. Right. So it happens all yeah. the time. And you know what? It can be brilliant sometimes. I mean, ODO With Twitter. to Twitter. You know, like it's, right. Sometimes it can be a wonderful thing. Sometimes it's losing, if, it's, if you're losing your attention towards it, maybe the idea is not as you know, valuable to you as the other idea. So you should go on to the other idea. Right. Piece of cake. All right, let's take our next call. Chris Horahan. Hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Here we go. This is working out well. Okay, Chris. Yes. Hey. Horahan, did I get it right? Uh, Howerhan. Howerhan, okay. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. And you're calling from the, well, maybe I shouldn't say your area code. Um, so uh, you have a good question. Uh, yes. Um, I am coming from, I think, a bit of a different perspective than some of the other people you, you've had on your show. I'm an employee at a small startup uh, company here. We're about six to seven people strong. Um, and I, I'm more in, it's, it's not a tech company, so, but I, I, I'm coming from the position of, I guess, what would be considered a developer. Um, but uh, recently, I've uh, fundamentally disagreed with uh, a project or a strategic initiative that the CEO, the founder, has um, come up with and, and sort of wants to, to push us forward with. Um, so my question is, how do I, as uh, someone that's not in the co-founder type role, uh, deal with this? Do I, I mean, I, I've, I've, explained, I've explained why I disagree, but things still sort of continue to press forward. It's a tough situation because it's not your ship, right? Right. You're a shipmate, uh, you're a soldier, and there's a general. That's the dynamic. And mm -hmm. if the general wants to take that hill, your job is to give them as much advice as you can. If you think everybody's going to get shot going up that hill, got to say it. But if at the end of the day, he says we're taking that hill, you take the hill. And it sounds like you did a good job of explaining it to him uh, or her. Uh, and, you know, if there's going to be a mutiny, uh, you know, are there other people in the company who agree with your position or are fundamentally opposed to what the person's doing, or is it just you? Um, no, so so my uh, my my direct boss, uh, he's I don't think he's in the position of being like a co-founder, but he's more of the executive level, and he he agrees with my position as well. Right. So then, what you could do is, you know, now the guy who's the CEO, he's going to be very defensive, because uh, as a CEO, all you do is deal with problems, and a lot of times the 
the people who are working for you, they may have great insights, but they may not see the big picture. And this is very common in startup companies is a difference of opinion. Sometimes the boss is right. Sometimes the employees are right. Um, what I always tell my guys is, tell me. Fight hard for your positions. If it's an enlightened boss, he's going to want uh, independent critical thinkers working for him who fight for their position. And I let people fight for their position. And then I ask people to switch roles and negotiate, you know, pretend they're the other side. So if one person says we should be a business to business company, one person says we should really be a B2C company, uh, then I say, okay, now switch sides and negotiate the other one. And then I take a whiteboard out and I say, here are the pros, here are the cons. And I sort of take an agnostic role to it, which is let's, you know, handicap the percentage chances of each thing working. In some cases, both ideas will work. That, and it's, it's not a binary thing. It's not a zero-sum game. There could be a company like Microsoft. Should we be doing a video game? I think we should be doing video games. I think we should be doing an MP3 player. I think we should be doing a search engine. You know, I think we should be, you know, they may have 20 ideas. And you know what? All 20 might work, or 18 might work, or 15 might work. And then there's all different ways to execute them. So there's, I, there's like, is the idea a good idea? And then there's tactics. Is it a good tactic or method for getting there? I think you have to get your boss, sit down with them, and say, I just want to really think this through. Not because I'm convinced my idea is right or that your idea is wrong. Idea is wrong. I just want to make sure that we've really explored it and we don't get caught with our pants down. We don't get caught in a position uh, where we're weak and we make a mistake. So can we just go through this one more time? And I'm sorry if I'm being thick. I'm sorry if I don't get it. But I, I just care so much about the company that I don't want us to make a mistake. And I see this opportunity, and I can't sleep. I keep thinking about it. So it, would you mind if we just talked about it for another 20 minutes? I know you're probably busy. If anybody came to me in my company with that position, you know what I'm going to say? Of course, right. let's talk about it. I don't want to be a jerk. And if right. you feel that strongly about it, I want to hear that. And if he doesn't respond well to that, then you know what? You shouldn't be working for him. He's a clown. If he doesn't, you know, but it, it depends on how you present it. You sound like you're, you're, you sound a little bit, to be honest, a little bit, a little bit entrenched in your position. You seem pretty convinced that you've got the right idea. And whenever I hear that, that gets me a little nervous. If you're too strong in your position, he's too strong in his, maybe people are not listening to each other enough. You know, maybe you guys need to argue the other side together. Maybe you could say, I can see your point of view. Here's where I agree with you. I, you know, this is virtuous. This is a great part of your idea. But it may, you may not have the right culture there where people feel like they can speak up or, uh, or not. Is that, any of that resonating? Um, I, like, we, we don't have the culture where we don't feel like we can speak up. I think everyone pretty much speaks their mind pretty regularly. Um, but, you, you know, your point of, of me being a little entrenched in my idea and then his, he and his idea, I think, is, um, is pretty true. And being able to, you know, have a discussion where we could, you know, look through each other's eyes, so to speak, and, and see the, the other position and, and try, to, try to see the pros and cons there, I think that would be pretty good. Yeah, and maybe get some other people involved in the conversation and say, hey, maybe can we have everybody write down on a piece of paper, which I, I did this in my company once, I, and I, I've actually done this a couple of times. Uh, uh, I have everybody write on a piece of paper, how long do we think it's going to take to accomplish this? Or of these three ideas, which do you think is the best idea for us to pursue now? or rank these three ideas, and then I turn over all the pieces of paper, I read the person's name, and I read their vote out loud, and then I put them in stacks. And then me as the CEO, I, you know, I can't influence that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I think I'm actually going to influence it, I can tell them and leave their names off. So if he's a good leader, he wouldn't have a problem with you doing that. You'd say, hey, can we put this up to a vote? I mean, obviously you're going to make the final decision, but wouldn't you like to get everybody's feelings on this anonymously as to what they're thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, and if he's an enlightened guy, he might go for it. And you might wind up finding out from your coworkers that they're, you know, six to two against you. And that might be enlightening for you, too. Mm -hmm. maybe, your, maybe your position's not right, you know? And so that's a, uh, something you got to consider. Don, what do you think? Well, startups are very dynamic, and things change all the time. And typically, startups have three or four strategy changes, product direction changes. Uh, this is pretty typical. And you're always dealing with incomplete information. Nobody knows what the right answer is. If the answer was obvious, then everyone would be doing it. The, the truth is, you don't know. You have to try. And it's sort of like marriage. Uh, listening to Jason here, I thought well, this could easily be a marriage discussion. Because I don't agree with my wife on every single thing. 
but I'm not going to divorce her over one thing. Right. Right. I mean, so you got to ask yourself. Five things. Is this a bet the business or, kind yeah. of decision <laughs> where if if you're wrong, you're dead? Right. If it is, then you need to really have this discussion. Right. If it's a strategy thing or a product direction thing that you can try it, and if it doesn't work, come back and do That's something else. That's a very else. good point, okay. Don. I think it's an astute point. You know, um, Chris, there's nothing that says you can't try his idea first. And since he's the boss, he got there somehow. You know, like you're not the boss. He did get there somehow. You did go to work for this guy. You must have some level of respect for him. So maybe the agreement you can come to is we're going to try this and monitor it. And that, I'll say that to my people sometimes. I, I know people may disagree with this. We have a 60-40 split. We're going to try this. We'll monitor it. If it's not working, we'll change it. Um, and so maybe it, you know, in your discussion with uh, him and the group, you can say, can we at least agree that the metric of success is going to be X and Y, and we're going to monitor it on a daily basis? I'm not trying to scuttle the project, but you know, I'm not, and I'm not trying to sabotage it. I hope it works. But, and you, you can't try to go in there and sabotage it, because then you're going to be the EOR of the company, and nobody likes to work with an EOR, and the EOR eventually gets kicked out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know EOR from Winnie the Pooh? Yeah. Everybody, yeah. Every, that's the person. We have a no EOR rule here. <laughs> you can't have EORs at a startup, because they just waste everybody's time. Uh, yeah. And so you don't want to put yourself in that position like I'm the EOR of the company. But you could say, what's the metric of success that we're going to you know, uh, you know, track this project against and my project and my idea? And let's track it and see what happens. And maybe you know, that, that would uh, help the situation. But uh, you know, you're going to make mistakes. And so even if it doesn't work out, and if it turns out you do his idea and it doesn't work, then your position is you can't gloat. You got to be like, you know what? We tried. We learned. And now we're going to put that learning into the next thing. And that's the truth. That's what start, good startups do. You get your you learn, you, in, you innovate, you evolve. Boom, 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 boom. Most startup companies do not end up where they started. Microsoft, perfect example. They were building programming languages, you know, basic and compilers. Then they wound up in operating systems. Then they wound up in, you know, desktop servers. applications and servers. And what percentage of the business is, you know, revenue is, a, you know, um, basic programming kits and, you know, whatever, any yeah. kind of programming. Tight. Tiny. So you're going to evolve, and um, I think you'll be fine. Do a little self-reflection about why your position is so strongly entrenched mm -hmm. before you go into this, because I think that's something you're going to need to think about. Anytime I think I know exactly what to do, I get a little nervous, like maybe I'm a little high on my own supply. You ever see mm -hmm. Scarface? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it says don't, never, don't get high on your own supply. Right. You, you need to make sure that if you're, why you're so entrenched in this position, does it benefit you for some reason, you know? So just be careful with that. Okay. okay. Awesome. Great call. Great. Thanks. Oh, hey, and uh, you're invited to TechCrunch 50. Oh, great. Thank you. So hopefully you make it. Yes, okay, cheers. yes thanks. Bye. Good. Okay. Uh, caller 5, Noah. Let's keep going through these. We have to get to the news. Everybody loves the news section. Oh, yay. Don, you don't have to be anywhere, I hope. No, I'm fine. Good. It's Friday. It's L.A. We'll just keep <laughs> going. I would love an iced tea, if that's possible. I hate to... All these people are going to be listening on the podcast now and hear me ask for an iced tea with a sweet and low in it. You want an iced tea with a sweet and low in it? Sure, that'd be great. Can we get uh, two of the iced teas with a sweet and low if possible? We're, we're, we're cooking with oil here. Okay, Noah. Hey. Noah Hendricks, you have a question. Let's hear it. Okay, um, my question is kind of regarding something you've been talking about lately in some of the shows. Yeah. It regards, like, a legal entity. Yeah. And you said last week, I think, that uh, every startup should have a lawyer. And I was curious as to kind of more expanding on that. Sure. Like what role? What role should a lawyer play necessarily right. in a startup? Yeah. And also, um, are there certain kinds of lawyers? Because lawyers specialize, of course. Yeah. And is there a certain kind that we should look for? And um, also, like, what what should I expect to pay a lawyer? I mean, yeah. Uh, these are all great questions. When you're a first time entrepreneur, I take it. Um, I'm a student right now. Okay, I mean, great. An interest in entrepreneurship. Right. So when I was early in my career, I was terrified of the concept of a lawyer terrified about the bills. It's very scary. Uh, luckily, there are lawyers who specialize in startup companies. And they understand that if they get in early at the startup company, they can build a relationship and then get more business down the road. So almost every law firm has people in there who are responsible for being like rainmakers and recruiting these new companies. And they will do things like flat rate for you or discount their services. Uh, even if you're raising venture capital, some of the VCs in the Valley will make their fee in, in the closing the round contingent on it closing. So you can work with them to close a round, and if it doesn't close, you don't owe them anything. Uh, and you can be aggressive 
we were talking before, I don't know if you heard the call about sales, uh, but you can, uh, you know, be um, very aggressive about saying, uh, can you help me out? I've got this great idea. I'd like you to, you know, can you, can you maybe give me lower fees or can you set this up for me at cost? And they might do it. Uh, and I've done it in my career. Uh, lawyers are very flexible in that way and they like to get new business and like to be involved in exciting new projects. So where are you based? Um, near Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah, so Kansas City, I don't know anything. I only know the Valley, LA, New York. But you're going to have to look for people who have raising capital, venture capital on their website. The best thing to do is go find some startup companies in your area. Talk to the CEO and say, who's your lawyer? Can I get an intro? I see. There you go, right? Pretty easy. Or your friend works at a startup company. So if you had a friend who worked at Mahalo, you could ask them, hey, can you ask Jason, who, maybe I can get a lawyer referral? I love to give a lawyer referral. It makes me look good to my lawyer. If my lawyer gets business from me, they're going to give me a discount. They're going to be good to me. They're not going to charge me as much for hours. I, I can't tell you how many people I refer to my lawyer all the time. You want a great lawyer? I'll give you my lawyer. He's great. Joey from Fortis. Awesome. And then I, when Joey sends me his bill, I'd be like, hey, Joey, can I get a little discount over here? I sent you three businesses. Uh, and I mentioned you on This Week in Startups. Joey Tran, Fortis, right? Great guy. Uh, so they're going to be more than willing to do that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of basic things you need to do. You need to set up a corporation. You may have heard the caller before. You need to uh, have vesting of the shares and all this complicated stuff. And if it's a good lawyer, they're going to walk you through all this. And there's a lot of blogs about startup companies and lawyers as well. Thank you for the iced tea. Um, Noah, does that help you out a little bit there? Yeah, I think that's pretty much what I was asking. Okay. Uh, and if you want to come to the TechCrunch conference, uh, you're invited as my guest. Oh, thank you. September 14th and 15th, as a student, this would be a very good thing for you to do. Yeah. I, I don't want to tell you what to do. I'm not, I, I would never tell you what to do. But don't be stupid. <laughs> Come to TechCrunch because you're going to meet everybody. And that one event could change your life. You may go there and get a job at a startup company. You may meet the part, your future partner. That's why going to these events and being present is so important. TechCrunch 50, September 14th and 15th. If you don't have the money, get on a bus. Sleep on a couch. Right. Do what you got to do, but be there. All right, I will do that. Okay, I'll talk to you soon, Noah. All right, thank you. All right, this show is going ridiculously long. We have one final call and then the news. Justin Howard has a question. And uh, I'd like to ask people on Twitter to just tell me how the show is going on uh, Twitter. Okay, here we go. Last call. All right, Justin, our last caller, uh, what's your question? Yeah, hi, Jason. Hi, Don. Um, so my question is, uh, we're in a situation that I think is probably not too uncommon, and that is that I've invested my own money in the startup, and we've got a fairly well-developed product, um, uh, very pretty low overhead, and Good. we're in a position where we don't necessarily need to take money. But one of the things that's intriguing to me and that I've been considering recently is the idea of working with an angel, not so much because we need the money, but for the insight and uh, the, the doors that they can open and, and to sort of help us steer the ship, so more of an advisor role. Um, and go ahead. No, go ahead. Keep going. Uh, I was just going to say, so the, the question is when, you know, you see a lot of advice and a lot of information on the blogs on approaching uh, angels and, and VCs, in a situation like ours where we're more focused on the expertise that someone can bring to the venture than the money itself, of course the money will be great for things like growth and advertising and things. Um, but really what we're focused on is the expertise uh, that the person can bring to the, to the equation. So I'm curious what's different about finding those opportunities and what's different about structuring those deals? Um, I would say the best thing to do is to bring these people on in an advisor role and worry about the investment later. If you ask them to be an advisor to you and maybe offer them a little equity to do it, uh, then they might naturally, once they get a taste of it and they're excited about your business, they may give you more. And so you can start just by emailing those people, calling them and saying, listen, I don't want to ask you for money or anything like that. I really respect what you've done. Here is what I respect about what you've done, something they've done, right? Research it and say, I'm doing something where I think that you're experience would be invaluable. Is there any way, and I'll meet you anywhere at any time, Sunday morning at 9 a.m., Saturday night at 11, whatever time you want, anywhere, anytime, just eat a cup of coffee and pick your brain about my idea because I really could use your help. 
most people are scared to send that email. But there are very forward, sometimes obnoxious, sometimes crude, sometimes aggressive, sometimes brilliant, sometimes sincere, whatever, people who do that and they put themselves out there and ask for advice. And you know what? You don't need to get everybody to do it, but you get one or two people, all of a sudden it becomes life changing. And so you have to be a little bold and send that note to people. And if they get to know you and they like you and they like what you're doing, they have an affinity for it, you've transferred the enthusiasm. Now, the investing in it becomes like, oh, well, it's obvious I'll invest in this. I would like upside in it. I'm helping the person out. Why not? Uh, so I think you should first make a human connection with those people and get them to talk to you and give you free advice and then maybe talk to them about coming on board as an um, investor. I'd flip it a little bit. What do you think, Don? I agree. Uh, don't take the money. Don't take the investment first. Uh, get a personal relationship with them. Have them be an okay, advisor and, and then go from there. Yeah. You're right. Um, yeah, it also can be a little creepy if the first thing in the email is like, oh, invest, you know? It's like, I don't know you, I don't know exactly what's going on here, why would I invest, all this stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, there's an uh, expression, uh, slow your roll. Slow your roll a little bit. Just ask for advice, ask them to have a cup of coffee, talk about the idea, brainstorm a little bit, and then you're on the road. Then the, the, I, I find the investment will follow if the project is good and virtuous and it sounds like you're in a good position for your business. Uh, and I think getting investors who add value is critical. Uh, with Mahalo, I could have done, I could have funded Mahalo largely myself in the beginning. I didn't. I said, who's the best person in search? Who's done more in search as an investor than anybody? And the two names I came up were Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia. They had both done Yahoo and Google and YouTube. I met with both of them. I went with Sequoia for whatever reason. It's a whole, you read that in my book five years from now. It's a good, funny story there. Um, but um, start at the top. Look for the person who's most, most aligned with your business. And then go try and get coffee with them. Go try and get them to take an interest in your business. And that's a pretty easy list to make. I mean, what, what vertical are you in? Uh, real time. Real time, like search kind of yeah, stuff? Well, we're, we're built around the, the Twitter ecosystem. And, yeah. Uh, there is a search component, yeah. That's perfect. I mean, if, you go, if you're going to be involved in Twitter, you know Fred Wilson's an investor. You know Bijan from uh, Spark is an investor. Chris Saka. Yeah, so Chris Saka. On, These people are on, all on, on Twitter. Bijan on Twitter, Fred Wilson on Twitter. Bijan and Fred both have blogs. Saka does. Saka does. So if I was going to stalk those three guys, I would read every one of their blog posts, and I would write an intelligent co comment on that post, regardless of what it's about and then just become a staple of posting intelligent things on their blog. Eh, maybe not everyone's a little creepy, but where you can say something intelligent, say it. Then, after you've got five blog posts on Fred Wilson's blog, you know he reads it because he'll probably respond to it, you can email him or Twitter him a direct message or however you do it and say, listen, I've posted on your blog a couple times. I'm a very big fan of your writing. I really enjoy what you're saying. Here's what I'm working on. I'm going to be in New York. I'm going to be in the Union Square area. Any chance we can go to the Shake Shack? Because you know he likes Shake Shack because he talks about it on his blog. That's how you get into somebody. They, they see, oh, you're taking an interest in what I'm doing, as opposed to this, like, me, right. me, 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 me. D I asked Don to come to TechCrunch 40. I had read Don's blog, and I'm sure in the email, when we look it up, I said something about, I'm really a fan of your blog. Yep. So how is Don not going to respond to that? That makes Don into the jerk for not responding, because I was so gracious to say, oh, I read your blog, I enjoy it. You know, it's, it's hard to be a jerk and not respond to that. I guarantee you, Fred Wilson, Bijan, and... Saka are all going to respond. It may take you two or three emails, it may, you know, but be persistent, but in a gracious way. All great advice. And I, I would add you, one thing. You go ahead. Be precise in what you want. Oh, yes. I get emails all the time saying, hey, can we sit down and talk? Right. You don't have all talk the time Talk about world. what? I don't have time to talk about yeah. whatever. Be very precise. Right. If I think I can add value, right. I'll do it. If right. I can't, I, I won't. So yeah. do all the things that Jason suggested. And be concise. And be concise, precise about what you want, where you think they can add value. Right. You can even put that in bullet points. Like, you know, I, I think there's like three things you could help them with. One. I think you might have some good feedback on my product, which I'd love to show you. It would take five minutes to demo. Two, uh, I think that you uh, might 
potentially at some point be a great board member or advisor to the company. Three, I think that Microsoft might have an interest in this technology. You should at least hear about it because it might be related to what Bing is doing, whatever. But yeah, I think, and don't write long emails. That is the killer. If you write an email that is more than one page down, I'm just like, oh, I, I can't, how, I'm busy. How am I going to read this thing? You know, when, anybody who writes a three-page email to Mark Cuban or Don or Fred Wilson, I mean, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. You, they, you know, Mark Cuban's reading on his Blackberry from a Mavericks game. Too much information. Leave them wanting a little more. So there's great advice from Don. Uh, be concise. And uh, sounds like you're doing interesting work. And uh, would you like to come to TechCrunch 50 as my guest? Uh, I definitely would. Well, there you go. Six tickets to TechCrunch. And in fact, I just, uh, yeah. I was just going to mention we'll also be at uh, Twist Up in L.A., so maybe we'll get a chance to say hi. Oh, yes. Yeah, come by. Uh, I will be at this, uh, this event. So, uh, awesome. I will uh, see you at both events, and good luck with everything. All right. Thank you very much. Cheers. Well, that went extraordinarily well, I think. We did six calls. It only took an hour and a half. It was absurd. It was a lean hour and a half. I, I, I can't <laughs> imagine that anybody's still watching this, but they are. There's 200 people watching this. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Are you guys enjoying yourself? Let me know in the chat room. Let me know how this is going. Yes, I know it's going very long. We're going to have to... Yeah, this person called me out. Uh, Raythe is like, uh, ironic that Jason's saying be concise since his emails are like 8,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> well played, well played. People are saying great, 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 good. Love it. Aloha. Thank you to the audience for giving us feedback. You know, we live for that. Uh, and now, everybody's favorite part of the show... It's the news. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's very commanding. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Looks like a real authority now there. Oh, <laughs> it's time for the news. I love that. Love me, Lon. Me too. What a graphic. Lon, let's go right to it. Let's get What's into in it. What's in the news? Uh, our first story, as of course you probably are aware, this week saw the release of Apple's new iPhone 3.0 software update, and today, this very day, marks the release of the company's latest smartphone, the 3GS. So we're now going to go live to the Apple Store. What? New, new feature. We are going to take the show live to the Third Street Promenade here in lovely, beautiful Santa Monica. How much is this show costing? Is it, we have a satellite truck? This was, it was, you know, one $10 million upgrade. No, wait a second. Wow, look at this that. This is live? We're live. This is happening right now. So this is live from the Apple Store. Outside the Apple Store on the promenade. Third we are promenade. here live from the Apple Store. It, surprisingly, uh, we can actually hear you. Okay, so you're at the Apple Store, and I'm sure there's a huge, gigantic line behind you for the iPhone, and the, the mob scene must be incredible. Can you guys move aside and let us see what's happening at the, I, at the store? So, so, Jason, right now there's only about a 25-person line at the Apple Store. We've been here since 7 o'clock this morning. And earlier, when the store opened, there was a good 150 people in the normal line and a good 100 in the pre-order line. Now, these people are in line to get a phone that has a better processor. That's correct. And you know what's interesting? When we were here earlier, uh, we saw tons of people playing with their iPhone in line, and there were just as many people playing with their iPhone original line. So it seems like a little All right. Uh, well, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, actually, no, so, that is good. Um, so uh, you have somebody there with you. This person uh, didn't know, obviously, that you can order the iPhone on the website <laughs> and not wait in line for two hours. So uh, ask him a question. Right, so I'm here with Ratchet Shukla, who runs an iPhone dev shop called Two Toasters. Um, he, in fact, was here this morning, waiting in line. It was only 45 minutes. But what's interesting is, Ratchet, with the 3.0 software, how is this going to change development for you? So first of all, I think with the ability to have in-app purchases, it introduces a new way for iPhone developers to monetize. Uh, we do a lot of contract work. So we've been getting clients coming to us saying, you know, how can they leverage this? So that's the first thing we're going to start to take advantage of in the software. And from a hardware side, are you excited about the 3GS? Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's got a lot more RAM, uh, better processor. So, you know, you can run, uh, 
you know, better, faster games. Your apps load a lot faster. Uh, so very, I mean, from, from a dev standpoint, the RAM is the big, big thing for us. Yep. So Jason, I was talking to Ratchet earlier, and one question he had for you was, as an iPhone developer, how do you try to get an app? There's thousands of apps in the iPhone store. How do you get your app to be seen? Yeah, I have no idea uh, how you get your app to be seen in the App Store. I think you have to do it outside the App Store because the App Store is just a listing of all the top things by download. So if I was doing it, I would get 100 people to order the iPhone application I have at one time on the same day and then offer them that you'd pay them back for it if they sent you the receipt. So I would go on Twitter and say, anybody who orders my iPhone application in the next five hours, I will send you a PayPal back for the total it's amount right. and see if you could get that to go viral. And then if you get, I don't know how many people to do that, they're all going to be talking about it. And you tell them, like, oh, just tweet back that you bought it, and then I'll send you five bucks if you download the application and send me a screenshot of it on your phone. You can actually offer them it's double right. the amount back. Uh, and then get yourself to go up on the list. But you know what? Everybody's going to do that tomorrow, so that idea is out the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, that appears like it's it from, uh, for us from the, from the Apple store. The line's short right now, so if you're in San Francisco, buy and grab your iPhone. It's only about, wait, we'll be here for a little bit more, so if you want to swing can by you, and say hi to Can you the ask him one more question for me? Sure. Uh, can you ask him what time his mom is going to pick him up from the Apple store? <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> ask him. Uh, do it. So Jason, so Jason wants to know when your mom's going to come pick you up from the Apple store. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That, that's so cruel. So cruel. But, uh, he does have a really cool, he has a great shirt that you'd probably love. Yes, that, absolutely. That fund me on it. And then has like all the different entrepreneurial sayings like we're the next big thing. We only need the one percent of the market. I think it's the perfect shirt to sell on Twist. Actually, I think uh, he, he's been such a good sport. Would you ask him if he'd like to come to the TechCrunch 50 conference? So Jason wants to know: Do you want to come to TechCrunch 50? Yeah, definitely. I love TechCrunch. Okay. So Ratchet will be the rest of the callers. Tell him it's only 14.95. <laughs> I gotta make a lot more money on the. No, Apple. tell him he's my guest. Tell him he's my guest. Jason, that's sport. like free. I, obviously, he's gonna go for the iPhone. Tell him, tell him that he's my guest at the show. I appreciate you him being. You are Jason's guest at the show. So enjoy TechCrunch 50. Well, back to you guys in the studio. Wow, I am shocked. That actually worked. Is that the first time anybody has taken a live caller on a remote on a live podcast? It's amazing. I've I don't think that's it. ever I've been not, done. I've not seen that before. It's a podcasting first. We're, this isn't really a podcast. It's a live video show. What do we call this? Very high Streaming production this is a, It's a web series. Oh, whatever. Who cares what it is? It, it's, <laughs> that's what it is. It's like a television show. For all intents and purposes, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, you're screwed. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you're <laughs> second oh, curse geez. word, 243. We're going to get a little jar. I'm telling you guys, that. you're absolutely screwed. If this show does not convince you that... We're doing the show for $300, and we just did a live remote. This show is Amazing. much more fascinating. I can guarantee you the show is more fascinating than anything that's ever been on the his CB CNBC. In the history of CNBC, with the exception of Jim Cramer <laughs> losing his marbles <laughs> with the whole thing, this is probably the most compelling thing that would ever be on CNBC, yet we don't care to be on CNBC. Who cares? You could smash a few things, maybe live. I could break a up. phone like yeah. uh, Jim Cramer? No, I mean, honestly, if we can do a live show for less than $500 with sponsors and three or four cameras and the professional lighting and it looks like a million bucks and then do a live remote, what is going on in the world of media? It is absolutely transforming. Yeah. Is this not going out on TV? This is not on what TV. What am I doing here? Exactly. <laughs> Next story. <laughs> Next story. Social network MySpace this week announced it was laying off 30% of its workforce is about 400 employees. New CEO Owen Van Natta explained the layoffs this way. Simply put, our staffing levels were bloated and hindered our ability to be an efficient and nimble team-oriented company. You still think MySpace can recover? And what do you think is Van Natta's next move? Uh, this is a great move by Van Natta. Uh, this is great leadership. The market has changed significantly. The stock market was off 50%. The advertising market is probably off 20%, 30%. 
it, it's only natural that you would downsize or right size your company. It's very sad for the people who are losing their jobs, obviously. Uh, and I'm actually, to be totally honest, broken heart, hearted about all the people losing their jobs in America. It's really very terrible, and unemployment is going to 11%. And there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering in the country, and it's why entrepreneurship is so important. But part of being an entrepreneur is making hard decisions, and you have to have the right size company for the opportunity. And if it's too big, then you're going to just sit there and be uh, troubled by the size of the company. It's going to create anxiety every day when you come to work, and this sense of dread, like, oh my God, we're too big, and we're not going to get this right. And we're going to go out of business, and they're going to shut the whole thing down at some point. So you can't. It's like the New York Times. You know, they, they have to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they can't get small fast enough. This is the right thing to do: <coughs> take dramatic action, get small quick, get profitable, and then you can play aggressively. Right now, they're playing on their heels. They're going, "Oh my God, we're losing money. We're hemorrhaging cash. You know, all these people. What are they going to do? Get smaller. Get focused on your core competency. It's a brilliant move. I think MySpace is going to be fine. I honestly do. I think they're going to work it out." It's a very loved brand, and uh, Jason Nazar, who was on the show last week, did a really interesting post. Uh, he did his view of what he thinks they should do. Now you've got three people who've done what should MySpace do. Of course, I did it first. <laughs> course. I'm just saying. I'm not, not to be conceited, but I did this post first. Then the second one was uh, Richard Rosenblatt, uh, who was the guy who Yahoo. bought... Uh, no, Richard Rosenblatt. Was he at Yahoo? I believe he was, yeah. Oh, no. He's at Demand Media now. Yeah. And he was he at Yahoo at some point? Anyway, he did Demand Media and, no, he, Intermix. He did MySpace before that. Ah, yeah. Different yeah. guy. Yeah. Anyway, he did his, and now Jason Nazar has done his. I, I don't know when I did mine, like three months ago, but two months ago. Um, it's a great move. You have to be the right size. And you know what? When you have too many people, I mean, you saw this at Mahalo. We had a lot of people at different points in time. Yeah. Lon works here at Mahalo. When you have less people, it actually, things work more efficiently. It's, it's sort of counterintuitive, but smaller groups, do better things, which is why big companies like Microsoft or Google or Yahoo try to, as much as they can, small, smaller, form smaller groups to tackle problems, correct? Right. And right. What, are, what are your thoughts on the whole MySpace thing? Uh, MySpace is great. It's a great brand. They're going to do very well. It's a great business. The backstory to this is the reason that they're doing this right. is because Google's advertising deal with them is expiring this October, and they already know that Google isn't going to renew it at right. that level. So right. they have to adjust. They are right. taking action ahead of that happening yeah. so that they can adjust. So it's a good move. It's a good move. And of course, uh, Microsoft's coming in as you're about to announce and taking that deal, right? Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so they can hire the 400 people back right after they close the uh, Microsoft deal. Yeah, they're going to be fine. I'm very sorry to the people who got laid off. Uh, if you are a salesperson or a developer, we have a seat for you here. So developers, if you want to work for an insane boss, I'm a pretty insane boss. No, not at all. I sit Very next to Lon rational. here. Right, right neck. Literally right neck. I would say 90% of the time I'm a decent boss. You're, you're a great boss. Except when I go a little crazy. But <laughs> anyway. I Great, I'm, great boss. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> you are a great boss. You missed the shot. <laughs> Who is running the TriCaster today? We're oh. missing every shot. Is there a TriCaster operator today? Sorry, I'm doing everything. Oh, OK. We need to get another person out there to help you. Uh, <laughs> he had a total deadpan. It was perfect time. There you go. I nailed it. Oh, do you want me to do again? Should do I one go more again? Time, one more time. Go back up? Okay. Back up. Here we go. Jason is a great boss. <laughs> <laughs> I had no complaints about sitting directly next to him. And the fact that the eight people who sat directly next to him before me are no longer with the company does not reflect on this <laughs> <laughs> at all. Uh, I don't believe that's true, but if it you may can't be good laugh joke. at yourself, who can you <laughs> laugh at? Um, no. Uh, so, uh, next story. Next story. Uh, there was lots of talk this week, of course, about the importance of Twitter to the protests that are going on right now in Iran. A little bit of debate. The Washington Post has sort of their article said, you know, it was absolutely fundamental. The, the State Department even had to step in and halt the. Twitter's plan maintenance so that it could keep going and keeping all of these people in contact. Business Week and some other blogs were saying they weren't as sure. They think maybe the influence of Twitter's overstated because of so many young people who are so visible, and they're the ones talking about it. So uh, what do you think? Do you think the role of Twitter is that centrally important to getting these people organized? Do you think it's being overstated by the media? And also, do you think Twitter is ever going to be sort of a news engine, or is it primarily this sort of conversation communication tool 
people out on the street can talk to each other. The thing about this is, is that news and reporters, they report on facts and they report on sentiment. They report on what people are saying. And when people say something, it becomes a fact. This person said this. And so journalists are now using Twitter, Facebook comments, comments on blogs as source material. And so this means that journalists can write whatever they want because they have 100,000 tweets about an instance. They can pick any number of those and make the story seem however they want. So they can pick 10 Iranian quotes that fit a certain profile. They can do a, a search on Twitter for just people who are saying one thing, or they can take the other view. And so uh, it is very important for the people who are there, obviously, to communicate. And when you see all these hashtags breaking out on Twitter, now when a hashtag breaks out, it validates something as a news story. So if a hashtag falls on Twitter, it's real. And CNN now got their ass kicked. That's uh, the third one. 250, we can take that out. I think ass is fine. Ass is okay? Ass is okay. Right. I don't know the iTunes store. Steve Jobs got a thing about this. Um, anyway, CNN fail hashtag about the pound Iranian election. You know what? If this was 10 years ago, if, if this was pre-internet, this would, the Iranian thing might be like not even A1. It may be like a little tiny piece in the newspaper. But you know what? This is a sign that things are changing because the what, what's happening in the world is directly being communicated to everybody in real time. It, it is very much game changing. I mean, te what television did to Tiananmen Square and the fax machine, people were faxing that information, you know, pictures out of Tiananmen Square and they were uh, digitally getting information over the internet out of Tiananmen Square, I believe. Uh, so I can look that up, but I believe they were using the precursor to the internet, BitNet, to send some stuff out of, the, out of China. That sounds right. Uh, and they were using fax machines for sure. Um, Tiananmen Square, if it happened today, they wouldn't have been able to go in there with tanks. They'd be too, uh, who's going to run over people with tanks when everybody's got a camera phone? This is why Witness.org, I don't know if anybody knows this uh, organization, Witness.org is a fabulous nonprofit. Their concept was just give people cameras. They, they were sort of like an Amnesty International offshoot um, idea, but instead of trying to write letters, just give cameras to people so they can document what's going on. Mm -hmm. If they document what's going on, how can people, uh, you know, people are much less likely to do something bad when there's a camera there. Sure. And now there's the same thing going on now. People's behavior is going to get better because they're being watched constantly by cell phones, constantly by video cameras. People know if you do something stupid, it's caught on tape. It's a game changer. And if it's caught on tape and can be instantly sent around the world, <coughs> and you know there's this sort of frothy system where if somebody gets beat up or tased, it immediately gets to the top. All these cops who are behaving badly, knocking over bike messengers, you, every cop is scared to death right now that they're going to do something stupid on camera. And guess what? Cop behavior is going to get better because of that. People are going to be, uh, unfor it's unfortunate that it takes the, the risk of getting busted to make people's behavior right. better, but these are fringe cases anyway. 99% of cops are 0.59% are total angels, and they're not doing this. It's just the 0.1% that get caught on tape that ruin it for everybody. But uh, it's absolutely transformative. I absolutely believe all the hype. I've drunk the Kool-Aid. This is <laughs> it, the fact that I, the Iranian election is the preoccupation of everybody for the last X number of days is seven, I think. seven days. It's still going on. It's because of Twitter. It's because of what's going on on the web. CNN would not be covering it to this level if this, the audience wasn't showing so much interest in it. So CNN is going to determine their news coverage based on the, what is going on on Twitter. Twitter. And, or any social network. It could be Facebook. It could be Delicious. It could be Dig. I mean, already you know, I mean, every time you watch the local news, the local news is programmed by some intern going onto the YouTube most popular list and going onto the Dig front page. That's how they do the local news. I mean, does everybody know that? I mean, how many times have you been watching the local news and you see a video clip from two days ago that you saw on, you know, YouTube where somebody Twittered? It just oh, shows the bankruptcy of the media. Anyway, <laughs> what do you think, Don? Sorry, I, I have no opinion on it. <laughs> I think Twitter is the latest example of the democratization of media. Blogging started that and uh, other formats. The days when a totalitarian government could control the news or when a news station could control what what everyone hears, yeah. those days are over. And yeah. Twitter is just terrific. When thousands of people are Twittering about something, uh, you can't be stopped. It's terrific. Um, I just got to know from the chat room that uh, Drank the Kool-Aid is now part of the drinking game. 
<laughs> oh, really? Yes. When you <laughs> two shots, toy. everybody. Okay, next. Next, uh, uh, this week, Michael Arrington of TechCrunch had an interesting post. He postulated that statistically, based on the startups that he has been covering, your startup is much more likely to be acquired if it's based in Silicon Valley than anywhere else. I know this is a subject we've discussed on the show before. According to Arrington's data, Valley Startup has a 6.9% chance of being acquired. Second place is New York City, only a 4.9% chance of being acquired. Do you agree, and do you think it's more important to have a great product or to be located in the Valley, or both? Uh, a lot of times acquisitions occur because of um, relationships. We talked about relationships being important in business before. So if you know the people who run Blogger or Twitter, Facebook, and you see them at parties, you can imagine what they would be like to work in your company. That doesn't mean that you have to be in that city. Um, Microsoft buys companies around the world. Right. And then they move some people to Seattle or whatever, Redmond. You know, it's just the nature of the beast. So. Uh, yeah, I would see it being, you would have a slight advantage being in the Valley, but that doesn't mean a great product anywhere else wouldn't get moved there. But there are moving costs, and people do take that into account. So for some of the smaller acquisitions by other companies, you know, you, uh, are we going to buy this? Are you going to move to the area? But when Weblogs Inc. got bought by AOL, they were like, we don't care where you are. People can run this stuff virtually. We don't need you there. So uh, it's a mixed bag. But yes, statistically, it would, it would be better for people to be in the valley. And I think what happens is the older you are in your career, the more established you are, the further from the valley you can be and still get treated seriously. So, you know, John Patel, as an example, is in uh, Federated Media, was in Sebastopol or something? I don't know. Or O'Reilly is in Sebastopol. Oh, O'Reilly is in Sebastopol. He doesn't need to be in the valley. Everybody like, oh my God, O'Reilly has to be in San Francisco. It's Tim O'Reilly. He doesn't be everywhere he wants. You want to come see him, you go see him. You know, that's it. You know, and Microsoft is not in the valley, and, you know, they have a big presence there. But, see, it's, it's, as you become more established, you can be further away. But, yes, statistically, it, it, it does make sense. What do you think, Don? Well, statistically, you probably uh, have a better chance of getting venture capital funding if you're in Silicon Valley. So it follows that there are more companies there, and it's yeah. probably more likely you'll be acquired if you're right. in Silicon Valley. But you're right. Uh, Microsoft acquires companies all over the world, yeah. everywhere. Uh, one of our biggest uh, acquisitions was Great Plains, and that was in the middle of the country in yeah. Iowa. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. If it's great product, uh, you'll be found and yeah. you'll get value. Yeah. I think it's being in the flow of things in the valley is important. That's why I always tell people go to events, be at events, sure. you know, blog. You have to be present. If you're out of if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. You really, as an entrepreneur. People need to keep hearing, oh, mahalo, 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 Twitter, 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 dig, dig, dig. New feature, new feature, new feature, controversy, this. They hired somebody, somebody, got, somebody left, whatever. It doesn't matter. They just keep hearing that name over and over again. And it just takes up a little bit of attention. And people can only remember a dozen companies. So you have to be one of those dozen companies in their heads that they're thinking about. And when they have a conversation at lunch or in a business development meeting, they, oh, yeah, well, what, what companies are you looking at? Oh, I've been watching this one and this one. And I was really interested in Stumble Upon. And oh, yeah, you know, I was thinking of watching that too. It's a limited amount of attention. You're going to get it easier, you know, aside from your product being great, if you're in the valley. Right. Should we do the Deadpool? We got. Oh my God! Is there coming that? Oh, the Deadpool. No, not the Deadpool. Oh, no. I hate the Deadpool thing. You hate the Deadpool? <laughs> no, I like Deadpool? it. I like it because we always learn something. <laughs> that is just very off-putting. That Deadpool. Solemn. Missed the <laughs> shot again. <laughs> wow, there you go. Can we, can we get one more person? Where, where's Crude? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, Francis Ford uh, Coppola not working out like I had hoped as a I, director. Can somebody tell Coppola to really, really get to work on that TriGaster? It's a uh, Godfather 3 all I guess that whole again. speech I gave before about CNN should be worried, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Wolf Blitzer's breathing a huge sigh of relief. Exactly. Yeah. Flowgram enters the Deadpool this week. The company allowed users to create interactive screencasts that you could operate within real websites. So while you listen to the voiceover, you could sort of explore, click around, and even if you navigated this away from the site, during the screencast, you could just go back and it would pick up right where you left off. Uh, Fab founder Ab Abhay Parekh said this week that the site was popular with its core users, but he didn't really see the concept taking off in a significant enough way to be profitable. It had just turned two years old this month. Heads up. Whoop. And, oh, just oh we just missed it. Here we go. Into the Deadpool. Into the Deadpool it goes. Right next to Microsoft Money. <laughs> Sorry about that, Don. <laughs> 
Let's see the Deadpool for a second. Let's just examine what's happening. So, uh, sorry to flowgram, but uh, it sounds like just you know to recap it. The reason we do this segment is so people can learn from the mistakes of things that have died. Um, in the case of money, there were many other services provided by banks, right? So it was just sort of duplicative. There's no reason for you guys to focus on it. You couldn't add enough value there. In the case of OQO, well, gee, the iPhone. Uh, in the case of GeoCities, well, people have moved on to blogging and other platforms. In the case of TailRank, it wasn't more than a couple of features. They went business to business. Project Playlist is going to die, in my opinion. It's sort of floating there on the life raft. Because uh, they're in the media, they're stealing music essentially, <laughs> or enabling people to do so, and that's never a good business model. You wouldn't know anything about that, Don. No. Uh, and uh, Flowgram, you know what? That screencasting stuff, it's niche. It's too niche. I think the guy did the right thing. It's actually screencasts.com or screen. There's like one of these pieces of software, yeah. screencast, that lets you do it. It's nice to do a screencast when you need to show somebody something, but uh, well, that's not like a huge business. Yeah, I mean, this one sounded kind of neat because you're actually, you can be screencasting and it's a live website. So right. while I'm listening to the voiceover, yeah. I can actually click around, I can check it out, I can see how it works. Yeah, the problem is when you cool do concept. those things, it's, it's okay, but when you do those things, people don't want to uh, be passive when they're on the web. It sucks when you're in front of a computer and you can't touch anything. That's why sites like Dig, do so well because people can at least click. That's a stupid comment. It's a good comment. I'm voting for it. It gives those ADD people something to do with their finger. You know, well, you know that's what they. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> oh, Jason. <laughs> this is why we shouldn't go to the third hour. It's too. Uh, it's long. It's a long show. It's a it's long bound, show. It's bound to happen. It's bound to happen. Okay. Uh, well, sorry to the, those guys. I mean, at Program. least you guys didn't. Give up like Jimmy Fowles. Well, oh. <laughs> uh, sorry, slip there. sorry about the Freudian slip there. Uh, okay, moving on. Moving on. Uh, if you want to work for the city of Bozeman, Montana, and, and who wouldn't really, they want you to turn <laughs> over all of your social network usernames and passwords. According to Read Write Web, the city's online job application form has spaces where you're expected to fill in all your login info for sites like YouTube, Facebook, MySpace, and so on. Uh, they say they promise not to look at constitutionally protected information and they won't use your personal info like your age and your ethnicity. When they're making a hiring decision, they just say they need this because they have to make sure everybody has a high level of integrity. So have you ever heard of this and do you think any employer actually needs that kind of information for uh, prospective employees? This was written by somebody who has never been on the internet. That's my guess. Somebody has never used the interwebs and thought that the URL meant I needed your username and password. So somebody said in a meeting, mm -hmm. like, well, just ask for their, user, their username. And they're like, oh, OK. Well, and then they said to somebody else, oh, get the username. And the person was like, oh, you want the username and password? And the person said, yeah, whatever. <laughs> That's what happened. Because nobody could be this stupid. <laughs> That's my belief. That being said, I would like everybody at Mahalo to give me their Twitter accounts <laughs> right now <laughs> and their Facebook accounts, except for Tyler, because I don't want to see what's in there. Um, but this is insane. It's a little weird. I yeah, feel almost it's a like it's weird. a gag. I, I mean, perhaps they, they are known for their sense of humor in Bozeman, so perhaps. This is it's insane. Town. Insane. Um, this is Bozeman, not Fargo. Bozeman, Montana, oh. not Fargo. Fargo. Yeah, yeah okay. No, they're <sighs> way, way more cosmopolitan than Fargo. They would never <laughs> think to do that. I didn't even know they had the internet there. <laughs> it just came last week. They're really excited. Apparently, that's the problem. No offense to the good people of Bozeman, Bozeman Montana. No, Bozeman, no offense Montana. to the good people of Bozeman, Montana, but we're going to take the internet back if you don't learn how to use it properly. <laughs> okay? Using the internet is a privilege, not a right, and we will take it back from you. As the chairman of the internet, I have this ability. <laughs> I can do it. I can do it telepathically. I can take the interwebs around. I'm, I'm lowering your bandwidth as we speak. Just my blinking. I just took you down to dial-up speeds, 56K, until you guys get your together. <laughs> I believed it for myself. All right, moving on. Okay, uh, let's talk about Hunch.com. It's a new decision-making engine that launched this week. It asks you a series of questions to get an idea for your lifestyle and your tastes, and then it makes suggestions about stuff, mostly consumer products, that it thinks you might like, if you want to pull it up. I told it I liked Rembrandt, that I lived in a big city, that I like bistro-style French fries, and that I don't believe in aliens, and then it told me that I should adopt a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. So it really, it's got it, it's well. got it wired. 
It when you knows said, me so well. When you said bistro fries, I obviously King Charles Spaniels and yeah. bistro well, it fries. Gives you, it gives you a choice about a bunch of different fries. Like you want, you like McDonald's I know, fries. I saw you it, prefer I saw Burger King fries. Uh, okay, bistro fries. Uh, so uh, I should add, the director of product for the company is uh, the former Flickr co-founder Catherine. Fake? Katerina Flake. Katerina Fake. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she's identified their competition as Yahoo Answers. So what um, you, you know, I got called to give a comment about this as a competitor to Mahalo Answers. I don't think so. I think a decision tree is a nice place to start some research. But as you know, it's, it's just a logic tree. And people have been doing these for a long time. So I don't necessarily think it's competitive to the knowledge exchange. I think somebody could say in a knowledge exchange, you know, like, oh, I went on Hunch and I, it told me I should buy a BMW. Does anybody have a BMW? What do you think of it, et cetera? But it is a clever idea. I used it, and I went through it and sort of talked about what kind of car I'd want. And it gave me, like, my, of my top five, it was a Tesla and a Corvette were in my top five, and I owned both those cars. So, but then again, I wanted a sports car and, you know, two-seat sports car that's convertible. There are only so many. Uh, so it's nice. I don't, I think she's brilliant, obviously. And I think it's a lot of fun, so people are going to use it. And depending on how they make it easy to set these up, like people doing them like Survey Monkey kind of, like if you can, I can make my own decision tree and then host it on my site, and it becomes API-like, mm -hmm. which I'm not sure if that's in there right now, but I think that's probably where it's going to go. Sure. So if I could say, for my personal website, I am a, I don't know, pick a local business. I'm a, I don't know, what's a local business? I'm a local like, wedding oh, planner. Oh, okay. I'm a wedding planner, and I do a decision tree of where you should have your wedding in Santa Monica. And I ask you, would you like, you know, the view? Do you like nature? Do you like cosmopolitan city? You know, what's your price range? Boom, and then I give you your options. That could be a kind of a nice experience. So I think that that kind of stuff would work. Um, I, I think it's cool. I think it's got a lot of potential. Yeah. No, the uh, interface. I, I'm not is, threatened is nice by it at all. I don't think it's very much like a Yahoo Answers, to be honest. That's what I thought was interesting, is she was comparing it to Yahoo Answers and saying, you know, well, it allows people to make decisions and it gives you advice, which is what you would do. But there's so much more going on in a Q&A site than just, here's things I like, what else would I like, which is yeah. really what Hunch seems to be all also, about. Also, it's, even if, if, you, if it does its job properly, it anticipates what you'd like. But people don't, aren't going to just say, oh, I'm just going to buy what Hunch says. They're going to want to go do research if it's a considered purchase. So if Hunch tells you, like, you're going to love... Um, you know, going to, because you picked, you like it out, you don't love Costa Rica because mm -hmm. you like the tropical weather. You're not just going to say, okay, I'm booking a ticket to Costa Rica. You're going to go do a Google search. You're going to go do a Yahoo Answers question. You're going to go do... Bing search. Bing search, absolutely. You're going to bing it. Bada bing, bing, bing. Oh. Uh, and did I mention, Bing is sponsoring this week in startups. <laughs> really? Yes. No, I'm joking. Maybe We're sold out. Okay. We're sold out. We're sold out. Ten week run, minimum. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, best of luck to her and the team. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great start. And uh, I look forward to watching it. I think she's got a winner. I would invest. But I wasn't asked. No. Oh. Next time. You Doesn't have to, you have to be round. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. It's too many investors. Too many angel investors now. Yeah, really. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> I got well, a wedding planning business. I'm trying to. I'm yeah, trying to run absolutely. Uh, Sends up my way. Okay. Moving on. Is that it? Uh, Is that I, have, I have some more if you want to keep going. Uh, well, I think we're running out of time. We're only in the third hour seems now, like, so we yeah, should probably like... call it. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody uh, who is still possibly listening, and it's a ton of people are because they're Twittering and they're in the chat rooms, and we're going to do the homework. So everybody has to do their homework. You can't leave the class without doing your homework. Let's go to the homework. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No music for homework. I think we need some music for homework. Can we get it? Can somebody in the audience submit an original composition for homework? Maybe put some lyrics to it about doing your homework properly. Uh, and uh, so we have a who's who did their homework. This is the part of the program where we assign homework, and then people call, and then we give them the, their homework assignment. Okay, here we go. Homework. Okay. And uh, on, the on the line, we have Paul Capistani. Capistani? Capistani. Paul, uh, we've traded many emails on Twitter. Or I've seen your That's emails on Twitter. Email on Twitter. Sorry, we, that, many tweets. Many, it's, it's a third hour, guys. <laughs> Give me a break here. I'm, I'm dying here. This is, this is two shows. You're doing great. Honestly. I'm, okay, so um, 
You did your homework? Yes, sir. And uh, did you do your homework last week as well? Uh, as well, yeah. Okay, so you've seen both the movies Deep Water and you saw Man on Wire. Yep. Okay, so I will give you the softball question first, which is very simple. Which film did you like more? Which spoke to you more? And why? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, Man on Wire was more optimistic. The guy actually accomplished what he was setting out to do. Right. Um, so that's, that's the answer to the okay. softball. Okay. All right. And just so everybody knows, there's going to be many spoilers during this. If you haven't seen any of these films, <laughs> pa pause your iPod and go ahead to the next, you know, don't listen to the rest of the show. <laughs> um, so uh, this begs the question, uh, what can we learn uh, from F Philippe Petit uh, and his 1974 high wire walk uh, between the Twin Towers as entrepreneurs? What can we learn from this incredible feat that he did? So I guess um, in comparing it to the previous movie, uh, Deep Water, like both of the guys were delusional, right? Correct. Um, they set out to do something that's crazy. No one else would try to even think about doing it. Um, but I think the main difference between Philippe and uh, Crowhurst, was it? Yeah, Crowhurst. Um, Donald Crowhurst. Was was that Philippe actually prepared, and he was, he, like, scouted out the World yes. Space Center for yes. six years. Good. <laughs> Correct. He, he, he had a passion even since when he was a kid. Like, as a young kid, he was, like, doing this tightrope stuff, and, I mean, he... Preparedness. He practiced it, prepared, yeah. Yes, this is critical as an entrepreneur. You have to prepare. If you, it's okay to be delusional but you have to prepare to do what delusional people do. If you're just straight up delusional, it's not gonna work out so well. <laughs> now, both of these feats were incredibly dangerous, and with Man on Wire, I have a follow-up question for you. Is it ethical for people to support somebody in the pursuit of something that is destined to fail and could fail in a horrible way? Is it ethical or was it ethical for the people who helped him complete his task to do what they did? Isn't that what venture capitalists do? Well, perhaps, <laughs> yeah. But I'm asking, uh, I'm asking our person who did his homework. Now, did, what do you think? Is it ethical to do that? Well, I mean, it's their choice, right? Like, you have yes. to gather up people who will, will be part of the team. And he had people drop out of his team left and right. Um, Correct. But eventually he was able to gather up enough of the team to actually pull through and bring it together. So, right. So I mean, now I, to it, join that team, is it ethical for you to help somebody walk across a tightrope between the Twin Towers and face what would seem before doing it as certain death? Can you ethically do that? I ask you. I guess if you, if you, if you think that... The, person can pull it off, then yes. Right. But what if there's a significant chance they're going to die? Is it ethical? Because there is a significant chance that he could, Philippe could have just one little blow of the wind and he's gone. Yeah, well, I mean, he had like a bunch of people pull out from the team. That's true. But I, eventually he got, even though there were random strangers he had met, like when he came over to America, they helped him out and he pull it together, you know, so. Right. So, the, the answer to the question is, you did okay. I give you a B plus. B plus. You got a B, you got a B plus. We could work Ouch. it up to an A minus if you, I'm gonna let you redo the paper a little bit. Okay. Now, is it okay to allow somebody to pursue something if they're delusional, is the question. If they are prepared, and it is their dream, and they've put all as much preparation as they can into it, I think it's okay. If they are unprepared, which you brought up, which is why you got the B plus right off the bat, and I think you get A plus once you just rework a couple of the first paragraph and the, the wrap up, this, this is gonna be mwah, perfect, perfect paper. Summa cum laude, what is it, what's the top? Summa cum laude. Summa cum laude. Yeah, that's, that's you're, gonna, you're, gonna, I, you, you're on track. Now, mm -hmm. there's a lot more homework to go this semester. Uh, it's, it's not okay to send somebody
to do something just because they think they're ready, and, but then you know they're not prepared, which is what we saw with Donald Crowhurst. There were people who yeah. should have stopped him, knowing he was a schmuck. I mean, God rest his soul. But this was not something he should have done, and people should have stopped him. They didn't, because they just thought, the, oh, well, the entrepreneurial pursuit is so worth it. Well, you know what? If you've got a family, you've got kids, and they're going to college, you've got no business risking all of their lives to go do a startup operation. You've got to figure out a way to do it that doesn't put everybody at risk. It's well, one thing to up, risk shouldn't, shouldn't he have stopped himself knowing that he wasn't prepared? Well, this I is, mean, the, yeah. This, this is, uh, the, you would think he would stop himself, but I think that he suffered. Philippe was confident and prepared. Yeah. And delusional. Yeah. Great. But Donald Crowhurst, I think, wanted to be great but he didn't know his range. And he wanted to be yeah. so great that he, his, his desire to be famous, his desire to be great was, was, was so out of sync with his actual ability. And this is what entrepreneurs have to do. It's great to want a dream to do something big, but you have to be able to know what you're able to execute on given the resources you have. He didn't understand yeah. the resources he had and his preparation was just nowhere near what somebody would need to do a solo sale around the world. He was deluding himself, and the people around him were deluding themselves or hoping for the best. You know what? Sometimes the best doesn't happen. But anyway, you did a great job, and uh, keep watching. You enjoying the show? Definitely. You're doing an awesome service to all startup companies and entrepreneurs, I think. Hey, uh, what are you doing September 14th and 15th? Um, I may be in San Francisco. Really? <laughs> Why do you ask? Why well, do you ask? Well, interestingly enough, I'm going to be in San Francisco as well, September 14th and 15th, for the TechCrunch 50 conference. Would you like to go as my guest? Well, that would be amazing, yes. Okay, can we get Paul a ticket to the TechCrunch 50 conference, please? And do we get enough TechCrunch 50 plugs? I think I, my goal is to make sure everybody knows when the conference is. I think we've established it's September 14th and 15th. Paul, you did a great job, and I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon and seeing you September 14th and 15th at the TechCrunch 50 conference. Yes, Cheers. Sir. Great. Good job. That's good. Lon, you've seen both these movies. I have seen both of these movies, yes. Do you think he did a good job in his homework? I think he did, a, I think he did an exceptional job, yeah. I mean, I was, that's, I was going to say roughly the same thing that... Right. Uh, you know, I, I think that it is ethical to help somebody achieve something that is their dream if that's what they're asking you to do and that's what they want you to do. But it is your responsibility to see, is this even possible? Are they prepared or are they just yeah. crazy and I'm just enabling them to do something that is irresponsible? Have you seen Deep Water or Man on War? I haven't seen either one. You've got to catch up on your homework. Yeah. Let's talk about this week's homework. Everybody is responsible for doing their homework and everybody is responsible for rating the show right now on Twitter. So rate twist from a scale of one, this thing is absolutely unwatchable, to ten. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I and, love this show. And give me a TechCrunch 50 ticket. <laughs> oh, no, just, you know, not every, everybody who listens to the show doesn't get a TechCrunch 50 ticket. Oh, okay. That would be 25,000 people at the event. That's we, true. We, that's how that's many people many. are watching every episode. I just thought I'd throw in one more, one more plug. Enough with the plugs. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so everybody rate the show one to ten, and here is your homework for next week. Let's roll it. Ready? Go! I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs. I play video games. It's the constant drive to be the best at something. When you want your name written into history, you have to pay the price. The fact of the matter is, Bill is the best classic arcade gamer of our era. I've probably seen Steve with tears in his eyes more than any other guy I know. Oh, he's just come up short in a lot of things in his life, and I just think. Nobody wants to do that all the time. Well, Donkey Kong, without question, is the hardest game. That's a tough machine. People think that the machine is possessed. The average Donkey Kong game doesn't last a minute. It's absolute brutality. The 
mysterious player from the West Coast. Steve Weeb is here. He could beat it if he... He'd have to have a really good game. You want to put a score up, you're competing against everybody in the world. It's not even about Donkey Kong anymore. He's a very devious person. He works things out to his ends very well. Well, Billy Mitchell always has a plan. Record headquarters gonna help you. Well, maybe they'd like it if I lose. I gotta try losing sometime. No matter what I say, it draws controversy. It's sort of like the abortion issue. Mark. Rent, King of Kong, a fistful of quarters. This is perhaps one of the ten best documentaries of all time. And you've just seen two others that I would rank in the top 20 and 30, maybe. I don't know. Man on Wire is top 20. Man on Wire is a great, great film. Yeah, yeah definitely. Deep and Water as a documentary, maybe it's in the top 50. I don't know. It's a, it's a good film also. It's a good but, film, yeah. but it's not in the top 20 of all time. It's not with Hoop Dreams or We Live in Public or Dig or <laughs> any of the other great right. films. Any of those other classics. Mm -hmm. uh, but you will love uh, King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters. Uh, Tyler, you've seen the film. I told you. You're the one who told me to see it. Great film. Love it. Tyler loves it. Are you mic'd? Not mic'd. Tyler's not mic'd and no Tyler Camp today. Sorry, everybody. Uh, and so people are saying the show is a 10 out of 10 and it keeps getting better and better. That is really kind of people to say. <laughs> and um, really love the show from Joka48. Um, it was fun holding the camera for the live shoot. Oh, that was one of our interns. Uh, 10 out of 10, can I please have a ticket, please? If you want a ticket, you got to get out, do your homework or something. Got to figure out a way to get on the show. Uh, 7 needs to be a little compacter and faster again. You know what? We had a big show today. I'm sorry that it went for 2 hours and 10 minutes. <laughs> Ouch. I'm sorry. I blame myself. I can't blame you. 9, really interesting. 10, 9 of 10, blah, 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 blah. Somebody gave something about BizSpark. They wanted to know what is BizSpark. BizSpark. Oh, yes. that's Microsoft's program for startups. What is that exactly? Uh, it's a program for startups, uh -huh. less than three years old, and it provides Microsoft software basically for free <gasps> to these startups. So that wow. Can, yeah. It's a startups, great program. I just I started a company last week called Mahalo, so I can get uh, free software for the next three years. Well, here are the rules. <laughs> less than three years old, okay. less than a million dollars in revenue. Okay. Oops. Mm. So you wouldn't right. qualify. Next time. Uh, okay, so this has been a great show. Uh, Don, you did a great job. As always, you never disappoint. I will Thank see you. you on September 14th and 15th at the TechCrunch 50 show again. Can't wait. Thank you for all your support. Anything uh, we should know or that you want to plug about what Microsoft's doing? Uh, BizSpark is a good one. BizSpark so is if good. If there are startups out there, they're just starting up. How can people get in touch software? with you? I know you're Don Dodge on Twitter, right? Yep. Uh, uh, or email ddodge at microsoft.com. ddodge at microsoft.com. Twitter.com slash... Don Dodge. Dodge. Perfect. Yeah. And you're pretty approachable if somebody... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's your job, is to be approachable. Right. And if they're a young entrepreneur, maybe they don't got everything together, that's okay. You can give them some free advice, you know, if they're concise, like you said. Okay. And uh, Lon, you did a great mm -hmm. job uh, on the you. news again. Thank you, sir. Um, and we'll talk about that whole little bit about me not being a good boss <laughs> later. All right. I'll uh, clear up okay. my things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good show. Good show, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Great job. Uh, next time, can we have somebody work the TriCaster? <laughs> <laughs> we need one more person. We need a, do we need more volunteers? For the, oh, I know what happened. We sent everybody to do the remote, so we had nobody here. Yes. Okay. My son will exactly. be here next week to help you out. Oh, is he really? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. We need to get some extra. If you know how to use a TriCaster or you want to learn and be an intern, email Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R. Is that right? That is right. At Mahalo.com. M-A-H-A-L-O. Tyler at Mahalo, if you want to do that. Uh, and uh, any other? Oh, DNA Mail. Thank you. Web Spy. Thank you. And Ustream. Thank you. Uh, Audible. I don't know where you are. I'm waiting for the call. I mean, I don't want to pressure you into sponsoring the show, but I, everybody's like, why is Audible not sponsoring the show? I'm Luke? not going to ask everybody on Twitter to say, why isn't at Audible sponsoring Twist? I'm not going to ask you to do that. If you do it on your own, and you, everybody, you know, and they see 10 times, people say, why isn't Audible sponsoring Twist? Maybe they get the idea. I don't know. But, you know, um, wow, so lucky to have DNA Mail and uh, WebSpy and Ustream sponsoring the show. 
The remote was flawless, thanks to the guys who are doing the, the, that. And uh, July 17th is the, uh, what's the domain name again? Local Search Summit. LocalSearchSummit.com. Actually, we have somebody from Microsoft that's incoming. Yes. Uh, and you're going to come or you're, you're on the East Coast? I will be there. Oh, good. Yep. Awesome. So Local Search Summit, I, you know, we met this guy. He's a pretty cool guy who's into the local stuff. And he Is said, that Greg hey. Sterling? No. Uh, um, uh, Espinoza. Steve oh. Espinoza. Oh, okay. Cool. So I, 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 what's that? Greg Sterling is speaking there. Though. Oh, Greg Sterling oh. is speaking. So this is what happens. I go to the Lakers versus Houston game. This is a true story. This is like a very important thing for you entrepreneurs out there. I go to the Lakers game. And I come out and say, that was a great game. Somebody took me to the Lakers versus Houston game. I said, if anybody has an extra ticket for game two, let me know. I'll be your date. I say this on Twitter. <laughs> I get immediately somebody emails me back. I have like 15th row for the next game. I have nobody to go with. I'm a big fan. You want to go together? And I said, absolutely. I'll meet you at the game. Meet you outside the Magic Johnson statue. I go. This guy, Steve Espino, is a really nice guy. He knows everything about local search. Great game. We had a great time together. He came by. We had lunch. He came to see Star Trek with us. He's working on a project for Mahalo now. Mm. And then he said to me, I'm thinking about doing this local search summit. Be like 200 people just to talk about local search and how it's working. I said, oh, I know a lot of people in that, and I'll do it with you. He said, okay. So we became partners in the conference, all from just responding to a tweet about a Lakers ticket. Business is personal. There's a good lesson from the show today. We're going to see everybody next week, Fridays, 1 p.m., and we're going to... And with somewhere over like the Like we always do with this.